Hello, this is Storybooks channel. New videos are posted every day. Subscribe and click the bell. Miranda walked home excitedly. Today, she had to tell her parents that she wanted to marry a young man. The 19-year-old girl knew that her choice would not please her father and mother, as they wanted to see a wealthy spouse near their daughter. But Sebastian was not such a man. Miranda met Sebastian six months ago. She was walking along the seafront with a friend when two guys approached them. The young men offered to spend leisure time together. That evening, Miranda immediately refused. But here Buddy Kelly wanted to communicate with the guys, and eventually the acquaintance took place. Young people walked together for a long time. While telling funny stories from life, Miranda immediately liked one of the guys, whose name was Sebastian. The girl also noticed that she also sympathized with him. She saw the young man addressing her most often. After a while, Miranda looked at her watch and told the company that it was time for her to go home. The guy sighed sadly and tried to convince the girl that they could stay a little longer. However, Miranda was adamant and told her new friends and her friend I don't want to upset my parents. If I told them I would be there no later than 22 o'clock, I have to keep my word. But you can call your mom and explain the situation. Just say you want to hang out with cute guys for a while, Sebastian said with a smile at the same moment. Miranda looked at the guy who was waiting for a response from her. The girl wouldn't mind doing it herself, but she didn't want to hear various questions about her new acquaintances from her parents later at home. So she spoke with a shift in her voice. I will not change my decision. I'm going home and you can continue chatting with Kelly. And I can also say that we can go for a walk the next day, but we just need to agree on a time. That's not a bad idea. Sebastian exclaimed, then I'll walk you home and my friend will walk your friend home. All agreed to this proposal. And then the young men split into pairs. Sebastian went to see Miranda off. On the way, he asked the girl about her hobby life, how she plans to arrange her fate in the future. Miranda told that she is the only daughter of her parents. Her father is engaged in entrepreneurship and her mother works as an accountant in a bank. The girl also said that she is studying to be an economist and wants to follow her mom's footsteps. And at the end of her story, she added that she dreams to marry a good man with whom she will live all her life. Soon the couple approached the girl's house. They stopped near the entrance and were about to say goodbye. As she said with surprise that she told everything about herself, but she herself knows nothing about the new acquaintance. Sebastian smiled back and said, you'll find out about me, but not today. We'll have an excuse to meet tomorrow and go out again. That's where I'll tell you all about me. By the way, I'll just ask you to leave your phone number. There may be a force major and I won't be able to make the meeting. In that case, I'll call you and warn you. The couple exchanged phone numbers and the girl ran home. All that evening, she thought about her new acquaintance and mentally imagined how they would meet again tomorrow. Miranda also wondered what kind of person Sebastian was. At first glance, the young man seemed like a decent guy. However, she had already heard of such suave and nice guys who were rarely with us scoundrels and slaga in her thoughts and did not notice how the clock struck zero o'clock and Lisa's mother came to see her, who asked why her daughter was still awake. The girl immediately replied, Mom, go lie down, and I'm going to lie down now. Good night. The next day came. Miranda had expected a call from her new acquaintance, but the phone was silent. The girl thought sadly that the guy had not kept his word. It means that we should not expect anything good from him because he did not fulfill his promises. In the evening of the same day, Miranda was getting ready for bed when the phone rang. She looked at the number and noticed with delight that it was Sebastian. The girl picked up the phone and holding back the happy notes, she said, I hear you're angry. I can hear it in your voice, no offense. But I didn't have a chance. I came from work, I thought I would lie down for an hour, and then I'll call you. But I was tired and fell asleep. When I woke up, I called you right away. Let's reschedule our meeting for tomorrow. It's my day off. How would you like that? It's a deal. 
I hope that tomorrow you will not sleep all day like a bear in winter. With a smile, the interlocutor spoke back. The next day, the young people met. They wandered through the streets and talked about different topics. And at one point, a girl turned to the guy, saying that he promised to tell her about himself. And so far, he hadn't done so. Sebastian smiled and asked what exactly would you like to know? I've told you everything about myself. I am waiting for it from you. The guy in response suggested the girl to go to a cozy cafe. As soon as the couple sat down at the table, and Sebastian ordered two coffees and a couple of pieces of cake. Only then began to talk the young man told that he came from the village. He has a mother and a younger brother. His father abandoned the family a few years ago. And also the guy said that he is 24 years old and he works at the construction site as a laborer. In the city, he rents one room with a buddy. The girl listened attentively to the new acquaintance, and when he stopped talking, she asked how much the guy plans to live this way. Sebastian looked at the interlocutor in surprise and asked how in such a way. Well, you will eventually fall in love and want to start a family. Will you take your wife to a rented room where your buddy also lives? Of course not. We'll have to live for that moment. Now, let's drink our coffee. It's getting cold. While I was telling you about me. After that date, Miranda began to see her boyfriend often. The girl realized more and more every day that she was attracted to this guy. She often thought about what would happen to their relationship in the future and worried that they might break up. The young people had been dating for two months. The girl's mother noticed that her daughter had changed recently. The woman tried to find out from Miranda what was going on with her. However, Miranda guffawed and said that spring brings her thoughts, and that is why she is often in prostration. Lysa was not satisfied with her daughter's answers, and the woman sternly said to the girl, you're always making jokes and don't realize that your father and I are worried about you. Mom, I promise that in the very near future, I'll tell you and dad everything. Don't worry about it, but I'm actually doing really well. Miranda. She told her lover about this conversation. Sebastian calmly listened to the girl, then hugged her and quietly in her ear made her a marriage proposal. And Miranda, hearing these words, immediately enthusiastically responded with consent. After the proposal of the guy, the girl thought about the fact that now it is necessary to introduce the chosen one to her parents. She realized that Sebastian for her mom and dad will not be the best candidate for a spouse. And now the girl went home to warn her parents that she was going to get married. Soon Miranda was sitting in the hall and told her mother and father about meeting her lover. The girl did not hide from her relatives who the young man worked and that he was from the village. Miranda's mother, hearing the words of her daughter, was outraged and said your boyfriend probably won't be able to string two words together in a conversation. Are you going to marry him? Come to your senses and don't embarrass your father and me. Mom, is social status all you care about? What about feeling? I love this man. You imagined it. It's not love. A couple of months will pass, and then you will regret that you wanted to tie your life with this guy. The head of the family intervened in the dialogue between mother and daughter. The man turned to his wife, Kelly. Why did you immediately hawk our girl? Let's get acquainted with this young man initially, and then we will already draw conclusions. Miranda looked gratefully at her father, who stood up for her. And then the girl ran to her room to notify her favorite person that an acquaintance was about to take place. Sebastian listened to the chosen one and promised her that the meeting would be on the heights. Soon enough, the acquaintance took place. Miranda was very worried when she brought the guy to her, but her anxiety turned out to be in vain. Parents liked the young man, especially the girl's father. However, although Lisa approved of her daughter's choice, but after Sebastian left, she said to her husband, I don't know about you, but it seemed to me that this guy wanted to settle down in life more than to start a family. Why would you say that? I can't hide the fact that I don't like Sebastian working as a laborer but it's fixable. As soon as we get married, I'm gonna take him in. And I'm teaching him the ins and outs of entrepreneurship. I don't know, honey, why would I think that? Maybe it's just a woman's intuition. Okay, 
You and I have already authorized the marriage. Now we have to get ready for the big day ahead of us. Soon the young people applied to the registry office and then began preparations for the wedding. All expenses for the wedding fell on the shoulders of Miranda's parents as Sebastian's mother received a small salary and could not help financially, and the groom himself had no savings. Some time later, the wedding took place. Miranda's parents gave the newlyweds the keys to a two-room apartment. True, not in the center of the city. Sebastian and his wife were happy that they would start their family life not in a rented apartment, but in their own home. A couple of months later, Miranda's father put his son-in-law to work for him. Sebastian plunged headlong into his new responsibilities. The young man was interested in learning the skills of running his own business. Sebastian hoped that in the future his father-in-law would give him his own business, and he informed his wife about it. Miranda smiled at her husband and said, My dad has already hinted to me that as soon as you and I give them a grandchild, he will sign over his business to you. So what we will slowly start practicing, conceive a child from this day onwards, with increased zeal. I don't want to rush into it as I want to graduate first and then become a mom. In the meantime, I'm gonna be on birth control. You're a strange wife. All women get married and want to be moms, but you want to get an education. I'd rather be weird, but I'd rather be loved by you. I hope so. Sebastian squinted his eyes and looked at her husband slyly. Sebastian laughed and nodded in agreement, and then began to shower the young woman's face with tender kisses. Several years passed. Miranda graduated from the institute and got a job at her mother's bank. The young woman wanted to live with her husband for another year for herself, and then they would think about children. And Miranda said to her husband, let's wait with the child for another year, so that I can gain experience at work. I don't agree with that. I made concessions to you when you wanted to get an education. Now, why don't you respect your husband? I'm sick of being your father's boss. I want to be my own boss so I don't have to listen to your daddy's instructions. All right. I'm not gonna cross you. I'm gonna stop taking birth control. I'll see what happens. A few months after that conversation, Miranda found out she was pregnant. She realized this because she was constantly embarrassed and the young woman felt weak. Miranda went to the antenatal clinic, where the doctor and congratulated her on the fact that soon she will become a mommy. Miranda immediately informed her husband about it, who enthusiastically accepted the news, and after the first emotions of soon becoming a father, asked her husband if she had told her parents. The girl responded to her husband's words, Are you the first to know about it? The parents should come the other day. That's when we will tell. Soon Kelly and her husband already knew about the pregnancy of their daughter. The parents of the girl were unspeakably happy that they will soon become grandparents. Miranda's father, as he learned the news, then told his son-in-law that, as promised, he would soon rewrite his business to him. Time was running out. The first three places of pregnancy Miranda went well, but the second three places there were complications. The young woman spent almost the entire time in the hospital. Miranda was very worried about the baby's condition and prayed to the Almighty that the child would be born healthy. Miranda was born before the due date. The young woman had to stay in the hospital for some more time after the birth in order for her daughter to gain weight. Miranda was okay with how much time she had to spend in the hospital bed just for the baby girl to get stronger. Soon the young woman was discharged from the maternity hospital, and she came home. The spouse prepared for this event. Sebastian equipped the second room as a nursery. While Miranda was in the hospital, the girl was happy that the chosen one was so responsible for the birth of a daughter, who was named Cindy. A month passed, as the young couple had a daughter Miranda with pleasure immersed in the role of mom. The young woman tried to manage everything. While her husband was at work, she was engaged in household chores when the daughter was sleeping, and when the baby awake, all the attention was given to her. At the same time, she did not forget about her husband, and another month flew by, and her husband came from work in a bad mood. And Clara immediately noticed it and wondered what happened. Sebastian gloomily looked at the chosen one 
and softly said that her father for some reason does not fulfill the promise. The young woman looked perplexed at her husband and asked what he meant, and immediately heard the answer your father promised to give me the business, and still does not say anything. I asked him about it, and he said we should be patient. Why should I wait for anything? He made a promise he doesn't keep, and that's not what real men do. But wait a minute to criticize my father. Maybe something happened if he asked you to wait. Go ahead and defend your daddy. The man said angrily, don't be angry. I'll talk to my father and find out everything. The next day, the girl called her father and asked him to come when her husband was away. The father was surprised by his daughter's request, but fulfilled Miranda's wish, and soon a conversation took place between David and his daughter. As soon as Miranda saw her father, she asked him why you don't keep your word that Sebastian gave you. We're going through a business crisis, and if I give the reins to Sebastian, everything will collapse. I've explained this to him many times and told him to wait a year until things get better, but I understand that Sebastian has decided to go through you. I didn't expect that from him. My husband's understandable too. He's been given his word, and he wants his father-in-law to keep his promise. I said I would. Now, as compensation, I can offer you ownership of my Sebastian automobile. In principle, I'll talk to my son-in-law about that myself. But how will you be without a car? We'll figure it out. The main thing you do not worry, David said softly in response. After a while, Sebastian already drove a foreign car, which was given to him by his father-in-law. Miranda was glad that her father had found a way out of the situation and did not quarrel with Sebastian about the business. The young woman wanted there to be no misunderstandings between her husband and her parents. Years flew, and Cindy turned three years old. Miranda immediately gave her daughter to a kindergarten so that the girl could learn to communicate with her peers. During this time, David never gave the business to his son-in-law. Miranda often had disagreements with her husband about this, and when there was another conversation on this topic, the young woman exclaimed in her heart, I have the feeling that you married me just to become the owner of your own business. Don't be absurd. I just don't like it when words are thrown to the wind. Sebastian said sternly, But wait, I'm not the one who promised you this. What about my father, and you're the one who's always harassing me? Take me, and like a man, talk to him about it. I have, and repeatedly, your father has only one answer, that it's not time yet. A few more years flew by. Cindy started first grade. Sebastian also worked under David. Miranda worked at the bank where her mother worked. The young woman dreamed of climbing the lending institution career ladder, but she did not succeed. Because her daughter was often sick with colds, and therefore take a sick leave always had to Miranda. Her husband flatly refused to sit with her daughter when not to say hello. And once again, when Cindy caught a cold and Miranda again took sick leave, she sat with her daughter at home and played cards, waiting for her husband from work. When her spouse was gone for an extended period of time, Miranda called her chosen one. He answered that he had an emergency at work and he would come home late. The girl asked what happened on the life partner did not answer and hung up. The same thing was repeated the next day. Miranda was in the dark about what was happening at her husband's work. She decided to find out from her father. She called her dad. The young woman called her dad and inquired about the emergency at work. To Miranda's surprise, Miranda's father said we are doing fine so far. What's wrong? The daughter told David what her husband had told her and about his delays at work. And the father, hearing Miranda's words, was surprised and said that Sebastian was leaving after working hours, just like him. When the girl found out about it, she was furious because her husband deceived her. Miranda waited for her husband after talking to her father, and as soon as he appeared, angrily asked him to explain his delays at work. Sebastian began to talk about the emergency. His wife interrupted him and said that she had recently talked to her father. Sebastian frowned. After that, and with irritation I said, Do I have to report to you? I can have my own personal space to use as I please. Do you have a family? Maybe you have a mistress. 
You're talking nonsense again. Let's go to bed. I'm not going to sleep. I had dinner at the cafe. Who were you at the cafe with? Miranda and her friends. With irritation muttered the spouse. Why don't you invite those friends to visit us? Are you even a smart woman or not? You haven't forgotten that our daughter is sick. Everyone ended the conversation. After this conversation, Sebastian started coming home on time. However, the man became estranged from his spouse. Miranda realized that there was a rift in the family. She tried to talk to her husband, but Sebastian said that he did not want to talk about it. The woman was in despair and turned to her mother, telling her about the situation in the family. Lysa calmed her daughter and promised that she would talk to her son-in-law on the subject. However, the woman did not talk to Sebastian herself and asked her husband to do so. David, hearing his wife's request, furrowed his brow and softly said I have spoken to Sebastian on this subject and I can tell you that he sleeps and sees how to become a boss in the firm. And I can't do that because Sebastian makes mistakes in leadership. Do you realize how that could turn out? But you finally gave him your word to give up the firm. If Sebastian goes bankrupt, it will be on his conscience. And now, I'm not sure about him yet. Let's wait a little longer, David said tiredly. A few more years passed. Cindy was already in sixth grade. And at that time, Miranda found out that her husband had a mistress. It happened by accident. The husband came home from work and, as usual, went to the bathroom and left his cell phone in the hallway. When Sebastian was taking a shower, the cell phone rang. Miranda decided to answer it and picked up the cell phone, which displayed a number sign sunshine. The woman pressed the call button and heard a female voice. Miranda was furious and shouted to the caller that her husband was a married man and followed it up by demanding that she never call that number again. When Sebastian came out of the bathtub, Miranda made a scandal about it. The woman screamed scolding her husband while he looked at her calmly during this scene. Only after the woman squatted down and covered her face with her palms did he say what did you want from me. I waited all these years that you supported me, telling my father to give me the business, but you did not make a step in this direction and you know very well that you and I are estranged on that basis. Don't you love me at all? Let's not talk about it, the man said irritably and went into the kitchen. Miranda followed her husband. As soon as she sat down at the table, she asked him if he was going to divorce her. Sebastian was a little silent and then answered that he had not thought about this question yet. And Clara realized with horror that now their marriage was under threat and it was quite possible that a divorce could take place. The whole next day, the woman thought about how to change the situation. And then she remembered that her spouse said that their scandals most often occur on the basis of the fact that the father did not fulfill his promise, but decided that she could only save the family if she got the consent of her father to transfer to the firm to the spouse. The very next day, she visited her parents where she approached her father. Miranda said that David was not acting nicely and was not keeping a man's word. The landlord looked at his daughter and quietly asked, Are you sure you want me to sign over the firm to Sebastian? Yes, Miranda answered firmly. And if I tell you that he has a woman on the side, you will also ask me to give the firm to your lover. I know about the mistress, and I ask you to keep your promise, please, said the daughter sadly and tears rolled down her eyes and after a while Sebastian became the owner of the company. David stopped working and gave the reins to his son-in-law. Miranda rejoiced and hoped that her life would return to its usual course and her husband would stop going to the left. The woman's dreams came true. Sebastian was actually now rushing home after work. The man began to go around with his spouse again and spoke affectionate words to her. However, Miranda's joy was short-lived. The whole thing is that when David transferred his business to his son-in-law, then he began to feel himself not a necessary person. About this, the man told his spouse. Lisa scolded her husband for these thoughts, saying that it was not true. The one seemed to listen to the words of his wife, but still worried. And in connection with this, he had a heart attack. The man lived after that for three days and then passed away. 
After the funeral, David Miranda felt a kind of guilt before his father. It was she who insisted that her father rewrote the company to Sebastian, and she shared her thoughts with her husband, who gently embraced her and said, You shouldn't beat yourself up over your daddy's passing. David, apparently, it was written on the fate to live so much, and you are not to blame. But my mom said that after my dad stopped going to work, he just kind of slumped overnight. I didn't kick my father-in-law out of the firm. He could have kept working there. Let's not talk about sad things. Put those thoughts out of your mind. Anyway, you promised me a royal dinner tonight, and I'm looking forward to it. Go on, get in the kitchen, and set the table. Especially now Cindy should be coming in from her walk. The wife responded by kissing her husband gently on the lips and followed him into the kitchen. The woman took out from the oven a fragrant duck that was stuffed with apples. Miranda put the tray on the table, and at that moment, the doorbell rang. The landlady hummed unhappily, thought her daughter had forgotten her house keys again. The woman went to the door and pulled it open and saw her daughter's friends on the doorstep, who were in tears. Miranda felt a chilling coldness clutching her heart and quietly asked what happened. The guys began to tell each other that they went for a walk, and Cindy suggested that everyone jump from the roofs of the garages into the snowdrifts. Everyone took the girl's suggestion enthusiastically, and soon they were standing on the roof. The first to jump was Cindy. She did a flip in the air and fell into a snowdrift. Then came the girl's desperate scream. As it turned out later, Cindy fell on the Iron Dome which was not visible in the snowdrift. The impact came just above her chest. Miranda, hearing the children's story, screamed desperately at the cry, came running to the husband, who had not yet heard what his daughter's friends were saying. Sebastian grabbed his spouse by the shoulders and began to shake her, but she only screamed. Our girl is in trouble. The head of the family turned to the guys and asked them to tell them in a nutshell what had happened. When Sebastian found out about the accident, he ordered his wife to get dressed immediately, said that they were now on their way to the hospital where they would find out everything about their daughter's condition. A short time later, the couple was already in the emergency room where Cindy was hospitalized. Miranda was sitting on the couch and sobbing convulsively. Sebastian, on the other hand, was pacing nervously in the hospital corridor. He was waiting for the doctor who was currently stitching up the girl's wound. It took a little over an hour before the doctor came down to see Cindy's parents. The medic approached the couple and informed them that the girl was fine, and she was now sleeping. The man also added that it would be possible to visit her tomorrow, and now it is better not to disturb the child. Miranda wanted to object to the doctor, but he looked strictly at the visitor and firmly said if you want your girl to be well, I ask you not to contradict me, but to fulfill my request. Sebastian answered the doctor with a nod. Afterwards, he hugged his wife and explained that they should listen to the doctor. The woman buried her face in her husband's chest and cried harder. Then the doctor called a nurse and asked the girl to bring a sedative. All that night, Miranda did not sleep. She thought about how her baby was in the hospital without her. The woman wished that morning would come sooner. She couldn't wait to hug her daughter and say both words. In the morning, the couple was on their way to the hospital. On the way, they bought tangerines, apples, bananas, as well as various sweets. Mother and father wanted to please their daughter with something. And now Sebastian and his wife are in the room of Cindy, who is lying on the bed under the drip. Miranda gently strokes her daughter's cheek and tries to hold back her tears. The girl sees that her mother is very worried about her, as well as her father. Cindy feels her guilt in front of her parents, and so she utters you will forgive me. I was the one who initiated those jumps. Don't apologize, daughter. Just promise me and daddy that you won't do such reckless acts again, affectionately said the mother. I give my word my favorite mommy and daddy. You know, I'll be a midshipman forever. That's what the doctor told me. How do you understand that? Miranda asked perplexed. And then, instead of Cindy, Genya had not yet answered a man's voice. It entered the doctor who heard the girl's last words. 
The doctor informed that Cindy will have a scar in the area of her chest. And then the medic approached the child and cheerfully said, Sometimes scars adorn not only the man, but also the fairer sex. But I already told you that. Cindy stayed in the hospital for about two weeks. During this time, she was visited not only by her parents, but also by her grandmother and friends with whom she was on the roof of the garages. The girl was eagerly awaiting discharge. And when that day came, she went up to the attending physician and uttered, I'm going to keep this scar as a symbol of my unconscious act. Do you think that's the right thing to do? The man in the white coat smiled at the girl's words and then quietly said that it was up to her to decide. And then, added Cindy, that in her life never again appear scars on her body, as well as scars on her soul, and wished the patient all the best. Time was running out. Next thing you know, Cindy was already finishing seventh grade as her grandmother became ill. Miranda realized that Lisa needed care and suggested that her husband hire a nurse. Sebastian refused this to his wife, arguing that she herself can take care of her mother. And with bewilderment said, but I cannot be a mistress for two houses, especially my mother lives in the center. There is another option. Let your mother sell the cottage, which she is no longer very necessary, and give the money to me. I'll use the money for business, and we'll have extra income to spend on Lisa's care. Do you have any idea what you're talking about? It's mom's summer house, and it's up to her to decide what to do with the property. And even if she agrees to it, it takes time to sell it, just like your side business. And for your information, do you need care now? How's that? You know, I've got two options for you, and it's up to you to decide which one you want. Miranda decided to talk to her mom about it. However, Lisa, when she heard what her son-in-law advised, became angry and said that Sebastian was burying her alive. Offering to sell the cottage, the elderly woman told her daughter that a property outside the city would be like a lifeline if times got tough. Lisa added to Miranda that she would always be able to sell the cottage. But now was not the right time to do it. And Clara spent several days thinking how she could get out of the situation. She could not leave her mother alone. And to travel from one end of the city to the other was also not an option. And then the woman came to the aid of her neighbor Lisa, who said that she would take care of Miranda's mother on weekdays for a small fee. And when Miranda would be off, she would live with her mother. And the woman agreed to the neighbor's offer. Life moved on in a measured fashion. Miranda went to her mother's house with her daughter on her last day of work and spent two weekends there. Several months passed at this pace. Miranda decided to leave her daughter with her grandmother on Sunday and go to her husband's house. The woman wanted to be alone with her husband. And so she has already arrived home on the way. Having bought champagne and fruit, Miranda purposely did not notify her lover as she wanted to make him an unexpected surprise. The woman quietly opened the front door and froze in the hallway as she heard the laughter of a stranger. Miranda understood the situation immediately and immediately went into the hall where she saw it in the semi-nude form of her husband, who held in his arms blonde. The landlady screamed Sebastian, not expecting the arrival of his wife. With amazement looked at her and asked what she was doing here on this day. After all, she should be at her mother's. Miranda was furious at her husband's question and spoke hysterically. Have you forgotten that this is my apartment? How could you? Bringing all sorts of fallen women into our abode. So I understand that you have no money to take care of my mother. And to provide for your mistresses, you always have the money in your pocket. With those words, Miranda rushed to the chair where the stranger's belongings lay. The woman grabbed the clothes, threw them in the blonde's direction, and loudly commanded her to get dressed. And get out of here immediately. And I don't want to see your foot here ever again. If you listen, you'll be sorry. You're not in charge here, darling. Calmly said immediately husband, and immediately added this is also my apartment. And do not offend my swallow, as I'm going to live with her, not with you. And it's a matter already settled. And with these words the man got up and began to dress casually. 
Miranda looked at her husband and could not believe that the man she loved had betrayed her once again. She watched as the lover helped the stranger to dress. After that, the couple left the apartment. The mistress, after the departure of her husband, and his mistress sat in a daze for some time. She could not even understand what she should do at the moment. And then the woman, as if came out of a stupor, desperately angry with tears. She realized that from that moment on, she no longer had a spouse. A few days later, Miranda received a call from her husband and said that he was filing for divorce with the division of property. The woman listened to the chosen one, asked him to come to his senses and not to leave the family at least for the sake of the child. Sebastian was adamant and said that his decision will not change. Miranda did not tell her mother all this news as well as her daughter. However, Cindy, who had not seen her father for several days, who did not come to spend the night, asked where daddy had gone, and I realized that there was no point in hiding it from my daughter. So I told Cindy that she and her husband were getting a divorce. The girl looked at her mother in amazement and asked what was the reason. A banal reason. Your father has fallen in love with another woman and wants to start a family with her. You do not resent your father for this, Understand that in life it happens when feelings between people are frozen. So you don't love your father anymore. Quietly asked the daughter. I can't answer you anything, as there is an emptiness in my soul. I only ask you not to say anything to your grandmother. She doesn't need to worry. Soon the court took place, at which Miranda learned that the two-room apartment is divided into three parts, and if she wants to keep the property, she must pay some share to her spouse. The woman immediately said that she did not have that amount. Sebastian then indicated that he was willing to give the money, Miranda, so that the apartment would remain in his possession. The woman tried to defend her rights in court, saying that the property was given to them by her father. However, she was immediately informed that the apartment was given to both of them. Miranda tried to challenge the court's ruling that the cars and business had previously belonged to her dad as well. But even here she failed, as all the papers of the deceased David executed a deed of gift in the name of Sebastian. All these court cases were a heavy burden on Miranda's shoulders. She never thought that the man she loved would do to her in such a way. And the most unpleasant thing was that there was even an inventory of household appliances, as well as furniture and kitchen utensils. Miranda was disgusted with sharing all this. She said to her now ex-husband, I didn't realize you were such a petty person. You can keep everything in the apartment. We will not claim it, but you have a daughter growing up. How are you gonna look her in the eye? And I'm not going to hurt Cindy. When she grows up, I'm gonna help out financially. Right now, I'm gonna pay child support. After the trial, Miranda and her daughter packed up their personal belongings. Cindy put in a bag, jeans, t-shirts, underwear, and then her gaze came across a photo on which she was pictured with her parents. The girl promptly got up from her chair and ran to the desk. She grabbed the framed photo and threw it to the floor with all her might. At the same moment, the sound of breaking glass was heard. Miranda came running to the noise. The woman saw that there were shards of framed glass on the floor. She immediately assessed the situation and approached her daughter with the words, I understand that you are angry. But smashing things is not the way out of the situation. You can't understand how much I hate my father at the moment. He'd even share a dining room set with us. I'm in a trance over his actions. A friend's parents are recently divorced, too. Her dad just took his stuff. And that's it. And my dad started sharing everything. It's disgusting. I'm not making a big deal out of it. Just realize that you and I are superior in this situation because we're not taking anything but our personal belongings. And at that moment, Sebastian entered the room, wanting to make sure his ex-wife had already packed up her Corinne's belongings as soon as she saw her father, shouted in tears to him that he was the most real traitor, and she would definitely take revenge on him for that. The man calmly listened to the angry words of his daughter and said in response, now you are speaking on emotion. It is possible that you are being motherized against me. But one day you will grow up, and this situation will reconsider already with your own view. 
This is purely my personal opinion, and mom has nothing to do with it. On the contrary, she's trying to make me stop hating you, but she can't do it. I want you to know that you are the most hated person in the world. A few days later, Miranda and her daughter moved in with Lisa, the elderly woman. As soon as she saw her daughter with many bags, she immediately guessed what had happened. She hugged her granddaughter and then Miranda and said softly, that's what it was all about. So girls, let's not write about it, but instead have a celebration. The three of us will endure everything and live with all our enemies, in spite of them, in comfort, enjoying life. After Miranda and her daughter changed their place of residence, the woman transferred Cindy to another school closer to home. She herself also went to work at another bank. Miranda tried not to think about her ex-spouse. She wanted to cut that man out of her life completely. The most important thing for her now was only one thing, to keep her mother alive as long as possible and to make her daughter happy in the future. A year had passed since the divorce. Miranda's mother passed away suddenly. The woman organized the funeral with her own efforts. She very much, by the way, came to the money that she received from her ex-husband for a share in a two-room apartment. Miranda buried her mother next to her father and after a while installed black marble monuments on the graves. Several years passed. During this time, Cindy graduated from high school and entered college. The girl decided not to change family traditions and become like her mother and grandmother and accountant. During these years, Miranda's ex-husband never once visited his daughter, although he faithfully paid alimony. Cindy was even grateful to her father that he did not seek meetings with her. The girl still hated her father for his betrayal. Miranda all these years lived only for the sake of her daughter. For her often tried to court representatives of the stronger sex, but all their attempts the woman stopped at the root, which surprised her familiar friends. Cindy also wondered why her mother does not try to arrange a personal life. And one day there was a conversation between them. The girl turned to her mother, you are so beautiful, you have such a slender figure that can envy the model. And you all alone. Yes, alone. Why don't you want to get together with some man? Isn't it bad for you that mom lives only for you? Mother asked with a smile. It's good, but it's not right. You are not old at all, and you can start a family with a decent man. And I'll love a guy someday too. Which means kicking me out of my parents' nest and you'll have to live on your own. You know, daughter, I don't want to commit to anyone else. I got burned once. I still have a wound on my soul that won't scar. And about falling out of the nest soon, you won't forget to visit your mommy. Of course not. Tell me, mommy, do you still love daddy? That's a hard question, and I can't answer. To be honest, I remember Sebastian, but only those moments when we were happy with him. But the last years I tried to erase from my memory. I just want to think about that man. That's good. Probably the folk saying is true that you will love evil love evil love and goat edifyingly said, and the daughter. You, my folk philosopher, laughing, said the mother and immediately added go, let's wash up and we'll have dinner. By the way, I have a proposal to go this summer to the dacha and see what's left of it. We haven't been there for two years. What do you think? Sounds like fun, but we have to live to see the summer. Some time passed, summer came, and Miranda took a vacation, and soon mother and daughter were already riding on the train out of town, and Miranda was talking to Cindy, and she herself watched how opposite, a young man cast admiring glances at her daughter. The woman involuntarily looked at Cindy and mentally thought what a beautiful daughter she had. Soon Cindy and her mother were standing outside the cottage. Miranda looked sorrowfully and her mood had fallen. Cindy noticed this and asked why her mother had fallen asleep. The woman pointed her hand in the direction of the cottage and answered that it was no longer a cottage, but a den for homeless vagrants. Miranda approached the fence and only wanted to open the wicket as it creaked out onto the ground. The woman turned to her daughter and sighed brokenly. Cindy jumped up to her mother, hugged her and said, maybe we'll rent this house, but not for a fee, but for people to repair the shanty. Who would need this junk to live in it? 
Your grandfather used to fix this place up when he was alive. How long has he been alive? He's gone. I think we should sell this so-called house and put the money in an account. We'll need the money in the future. Maybe you're right. I told you to find a decent man and start a family. And you're always against it. And now if I had a husband with me, we'd renovate this place. This place needs a man's hands to fix it up. In fact, it seems to me that this hovel should be torn down and a new hut built. Again you start sermons about matchmaking, said in response mother jokingly threatened with her fist, and immediately followed by adding we will sell, at least for a place of money to learn. Miranda managed to sell the dacha only by the end of the summer. The woman received little money, as she had absolutely no skill, profitable to paint the merits of the plot. But Miranda was happy and this money, which she immediately put on a bank card. Time moved on imperceptibly. And now Cindy was graduating from college. The girl dreamed of getting a job as soon as possible. Moreover, her mother agreed with the management of the bank, where she herself worked, so that Cindy was taken to the credit institution. Cindy worked under her mother's supervision. Before graduating from college, there were only a few days left, and the girl was returning home after studying. She was passing near the cafe when she smelled the aroma of fresh, over-brewed coffee. Cindy could not resist the temptation and looked into the cafe. The girl knew very well that this establishment was not a cheap one, but the aroma was too tempting. Cindy sat down at a table, and a waiter came to her at once. A young guy handed her a menu, but the girl gestured that she only wanted a cup of coffee. The waiter nodded with a displeased look and moved away from the table. The girl had to wait just a couple of minutes as a young man in a uniform already placed in front of her a clay miniature cup with a flavorful drink. Cindy thanked the waiter, and when he stepped away she looked around. There were few people in the cafe, and they were mostly young people sitting in pairs. The girl at this moment thought how romantic it would be to sit here with a young man and talk peacefully to the sound of a melody, and only Cindy took the cup of coffee with two fingers by the handle. As behind herself she heard a man's voice, which was clearly addressing her. The girl looked back unhappily. She did not want at the moment to be interrupted from savoring the aromatic drink. And when Cindy turned around, she saw a status tall guy in front of her, who, smiling amiably, said, Can I break your loneliness? Especially since I always take this table. It is not written here that this is your place. Without noticing it, the girl replied in a hostile tone, I will consider that you just told me to sit next to you. Without stopping smiling, spoke the stranger, and at the same moment sat down. Opposite the girl to him instantly came the waiter and took the order. Meanwhile, the young man, not paying attention to the hostility of the girl, extended his hand to her and politely said, My name is Kevin. And what do they call you? And you are an impudent type. First of all, sat down at the table without waiting for my consent. Second of all, you want to meet me. When I don't want to do that, it's too late to back out. Since you know my name, I'll have to tell you mine too. I promise I won't tell anyone else the name of my charming companion. And you are also a cheeky type. With a laugh said the girl and immediately continued. All right, you've persuaded though, or rather, imposed your communication. My name is Cindy. After that, the young people casually chatted. For some time, Kevin tried to maintain an easy conversation. The girl was well aware that the guy knows how to make the interlocutor feel at ease. This fact impressed Cindy, but at the same time a little deterred her. She feared that in this way the guy would become an obsessive beau. But this did not happen. After an hour spent talking in the cafe, the young man offered to exchange phone numbers and apologize that he could not walk the girl home. He explained that at the moment he had urgent business to attend to. Cindy dictated her phone number, and then the young man gallantly said goodbye and left the cafe. The girl only had time to notice that the guy got into a beautiful foreign car, and the car soon moved. After the acquaintance, several days passed. Cindy kept waiting for a call from Bone. The girl involuntarily for herself often thought about the new acquaintance. 
and it began to annoy her. She tried to push away the thoughts of the guy, but she failed. When a week passed after a fleeting meeting, Cindy did not hope that the young man would make himself known. But it happened when the girl sat at home and read a lecture. It was already 12 o'clock when the bell rang. Cindy looked at the cell phone with surprise and thought that it was probably a wrong number. She dropped the call, but the ringing repeated. The girl picked up the phone with irritation and wanted to say rude things, as heard the voice of Kevin, who greetingly said do not hurry, still prickly especially found time to call, that he wanted to hear your voice and meet tomorrow in the same cafe, but only a little later. I want to see you there at 18 o'clock. Cindy only wanted to answer the bard. How did the receiver beep? The girl was angry that she was not allowed to finish and decided to call herself to tell Kevin that this is not how real men behave. She dialed the guy, but the man dropped the call. The girl made several more attempts, but the result was the same. Cindy didn't make any more calls. She lay on the bed and thought about the young man. As a few minutes later came a text message from Bone, which said I know, pissed off, but this way you will definitely come to the cafe. Cindy, after reading the message, laughed merrily and thought, how enterprising is this guy? And only after that the girl turned on her side and soon fell asleep. In the morning she was awakened by her mom, who was interested, asked who had called Cindy that night. The girl was embarrassed by her mother's question and lied saying it was a wrong number. At the appointed hour, Cindy arrived at the cafe, where she saw Kevin at the table. He was sitting and looking at a newspaper. The girl came up and said sternly that she wanted such late calls to be no more. The young man looked at the girl's stern face and trying to hold back laughter, promised that such a thing would not happen again. And then the guy offered Cindy to sit down and order, but she only asked for a cup of coffee. The young people talked for a long time. Kevin asked the interlocutor to tell about herself. The girl did not resist and briefly told about herself, and then asked the man to do the same. Kevin said that he was graduating from a foreign language university and was 25 years old. After this meeting, Kevin began to call Cindy frequently. They met rarely, as the young man kept saying that he had urgent matters to attend to. Cindy was often annoyed by this fact, and when a month passed from their acquaintance, she directly asked the guy what kind of business he had that required such a hurry. The guy smiled in response and replied that the time would come, and she would find out. Cindy decided that she would not pressure the young man and would wait for the moment when he himself wanted to tell everything. The girl's mother noticed that her daughter has been behaving in a very mysterious way lately. When Cindy is called, she tries to howl in the stairwell or tightly closes the door to her room. And this never used to happen before. And it also seemed strange to Miranda that her daughter, if she goes out in the evenings, she does not call her friends beforehand. So the woman decided to call Cindy for a frank conversation. She said, is it just me or is it? Are you really in love? Why would you think that? When I fell in love, I acted that way. I became secretive. How are you now? The woman said with a smile. I've got a young man, but it's just a simple conversation that doesn't involve anything. I can't tell you more than that. After this conversation, a week passed and Cindy met Kevin. They were driving around town and chatting merrily as always. Just then a young man pulled into a small prologue and slowed down. The girl looked at Costia with surprise and he confessed his feelings to her in full earnest. Cindy was amazed at the words of the guy and asked softly what is this? A marriage proposal. It's not quite right, but it's almost right. You don't have to tell me. You probably have urgent matters again that prevent you from speaking in no riddles. Don't be angry. Just give me some time, and I'll explain everything to you. A week passed after that conversation. The girl was already planning to get a job at her mother's place, and before going out to work at the bank, she decided to update her closet. Cindy told her mom about her idea, and she gladly supported it. Miranda gave her daughter the money and wished her a good shopping trip. 
Cindy wanted to buy herself a white strict blouse and a pencil skirt. The girl went to the city center to an expensive boutique. She looked at the blouses for a long time and stopped on two, which were completely different in style. Cindy was already approaching, for example, in the booth as she noticed a familiar figure. It was Kevin. And next to him stood a spectacular brunette who was twirling near the mirror and enthusiastically told the man a fancy suit. Thank you, honey, this will be my present from you for our three years of marriage. Cindy at that moment could not believe her ears. That the brunette had said that. The girl moved closer to the couple, and at the same moment she saw that Bone had a wedding ring on her right ring finger. Cindy felt a bad though. And by an effort of will she forced herself to restrain a cry of disappointment. And at the same second the young man turned around, who realized everything from the girl's face. Cindy with one lip said to the guy only one word I hate, and after that she gave the blouses to the saleswoman, who did not even have time to try them on. Cindy ran outside and got into a cab, giving her address. She flew home and locked herself in her room. Miranda was puzzled as to what had befallen her daughter. She heard Cindy crying and asked her to open the door to talk to her. Meanwhile, Cindy's cell phone rang incessantly, but she did not answer it. Only after some time the girl came out of her room and headed for the bathroom. But Miranda stopped her and hugged her gently, and then offered to go to the kitchen to drink tea. The landlady sat her daughter on a chair and softly said, And now, my sunshine, tell mommy what happened. Cindy Sobs explained to her mom that she has been dating for a little over two months now with a young man, and he had just recently confessed his love to her, and in doing so made it clear that he was going to propose to her. And today, Cindy found out that he has a wife to whom the man has been married for three years. And then the girl talked about meeting the guy at a boutique. When the daughter finished talking, Miranda stroked her head and asked her to calm down and then asked if this young man was the one who was calling everything at this particular time. Cindy nodded in response. Then Miranda said that it was necessary to give the man a chance to speak. The girl looked at her mother in bewilderment and said, Why should I do that? He has deceived me. Do you want me to hear another fairy tale from this liar? Why didn't you? Just give him the word, and then you're gonna take it out on me. Don't you want to know what a man who's obviously in your heart has to say? Don't tell me I'm wrong about the last part. Miranda said quietly. Okay, mom, I'll talk to him. Soon the girl answered the phone. Sebastian asked to meet her for at least half an hour. Cindy told the place where she would wait for him and the time. Soon the young people saw each other. The man this time had a ring on his finger. The girl, seeing it on the guy's hand, involuntarily twitched her shoulders. This movement did not escape the young man. And he spoke, Yes, I am married, and I have concealed this fact from myself. But the whole point is that I'm going to get a divorce. Our marriage is a mistake. My wife, Christina, a spoiled, capricious girl, and after living with her for a year and a half, I realized I made a mistake marrying her. But the thing is, her father has a lot of connections and he's a big man in this town. And now, I want to go abroad for a year. I already told Christina that I have a sweetheart, and it's you. When she found out, she told me I'd never get an internship. And I told you what that means to me. What kind of fairy tale are you trying to tell me? In this case, I haven't lied to you a single word. If you want me to turn down the internship, I'll take the papers and file for divorce right now. You're very precious to me and I don't want to lose you. When I saw you in the cafe, I immediately realized that this is the kind of woman I need in my life, who behaves independently, does not build a figure. I don't know how else to prove to you that I love you. It's up to you. What do I have to do? And I can't believe it all at once. You should have told me all this at once, and not after I saw you in the boutique, trying to hold back tears, said the girl. Are you right? I should have said it beforehand. I was cowardly, and I'm not going to make excuses for it now. And now I've suggested to you that I should call my wife in front of you and tell her that we're splitting up. I don't want any internship. You don't have to call anybody. Just give me time to think about it. 
Now I'm tired, and I'm going home. Don't walk me home. And don't call me. I'll call you later when I fought it over. After that, the girl turned and hurried home. On the way, she pondered the young man's words. She really wanted to believe that everything Sebastian had told her would actually be true. Coming home, Cindy held nothing back. Told about everything to her mother Miranda after her daughter's narration reflected. The woman saw that her girl was suffering as she was in love with this young man. And Miranda asked only two questions to her daughter. Do you yourself trust what you have heard? What does your heart tell you, mother? I love him, and I've seen him speak his heart with sincerity. But for some reason, my mind resists it. I don't know what to do. What would you do in my situation? I trust a woman's intuition, and I trust my heart. But you take my advice, don't take it into account. I don't want you to think it's my fault. But if you want, I can meet Sebastian and talk to him. But I don't think I can tell from the first meeting what kind of man he really is. Don't, Mommy. You've done a good job of helping me now. The daughter said gratefully and hugged her mother tenderly. Cindy thought about it for a few days. During this time, Sebastian did not call her because he promised not to disturb her until she made a decision. In the meantime, the girl was as if between two fires. She did not know what to do in this situation. After all, on the one hand, she wanted to be with this man always, as she loved the man with all her heart. And on the other hand, Cindy was afraid that the guy would just take advantage of her naivety and deceive her. And yet the girl made a decision. Her feelings for Sebastian won, and she risked to trust this man. Now Cindy only had to decide what to do. Choose the option that the guy went to an internship or right now announced to his wife that he takes a divorce and at the same time forget about abroad. The girl knew how important this internship was for Sebastian and realized that if they suggest to her lover to tell his wife about the divorce, then later she herself will regret that she acted in such a way. And soon Cindy called the chosen one and scheduled a meeting. As soon as the young people met, the girl told the guy about her decision and immediately added that if he started a double game, it will all return to him a hundredfold in the future. Sebastian, hearing that Cindy was not going to break off the relationship with him with fervor, said what other game? I love you and I want to be together. Since you haven't called, I've been exhausted. And I had a little surprise for you. With these words, the guy took out of his jacket pocket a red box. He handed it to the girl and quietly said, Very soon you and I will legalize our relationship. And now I gave you this ring as a sign that you are already a shrine. Time slowly went on. The young people met occasionally, but called each other almost every day. Sebastian always asked how the girl was doing. And at the same time, he did not forget to tell Cindy how much he loved her and missed her. Miranda saw that her daughter had recovered her spirits and was happy for her. But the woman's heart was heavy. She herself did not know what was troubling her. And when Cindy came back from another date pensive, she turned to her daughter and asked her why she was sad. The daughter looked at her mother and spoke in a whisper. Sebastian is leaving in a few days. We won't see him for six months. He won't call much. But you know that yourself, my daughter. But you knew you were going to be separated and you should be ready for it. I know, mom, but it's still very hard for me to be away from him for so long. I have a small favor to ask of you. Can I spend the day after tomorrow with Sebastian? Don't worry, he didn't ask for it. It's my decision. Miranda looked sadly at her daughter after her words. She was silent for a while, thinking about how to answer her daughter's request. And then after a short pause, she said, You're not 18 years old anymore, and you're making your own decision. And if you want to be with this person all day, then you are going to take this step consciously and you will not be stopped by my refusal, although I'm not going to talk you out of anything. All I can say is, don't make a mistake in your decision, so you won't regret it later. Sebastian soon left. Cindy was in a depressed mood after the departure of her lover. Miranda saw that her daughter was trying to appear cheerful, but the woman realized that it was only for show. Miranda tried her best to distract Cindy from her sad thoughts, and when a month had passed since Sebastian's departure 
and there was still no news from him, the woman suggested that her daughter go shopping. The girl looked at her mother disapprovingly and said, I don't have time to dress up now. I understand you, but are you really throwing away your own mother? Who told you I don't want to look elegant? Cindy looked at her mother in surprise. She had already forgotten the last time her mother had bought herself. Miranda realized that she had achieved her goal as she had stumped her daughter with a suggestion, which was exactly what she was seeking at the moment. After all, she didn't really need her again. And Cindy, when she had recovered from her initial emotions, turned to her mother. I missed something. Did you get a man? No, but maybe I'm going to get some old bachelor. The woman said with a laugh. Another month flew by and Cindy, sitting at home with her mother, was talking about accounting after work. Just at that moment, her cell phone rang. The girl jumped up as Miranda had already and ran to grab the phone. And soon Miranda heard her daughter happily talking on the cell phone. The landlady immediately guessed that Sebastian had called. And in fact, a few minutes later, a happy Cindy came in and said that her lover had called. Several months passed. During this time, Sebastian called and sent text messages several times, and soon the young man said that he would come home for a week to celebrate the new year. Cindy was thrilled with the news. Miranda saw how her daughter was happy about the event, but it seemed to her that the girl was celebrating prematurely. And so a few days before the arrival of the young man, Cindy said, And I am glad that your chosen one is coming soon. But don't get too excited, because he will probably spend New Year's Eve not with you, but with his wife. You know how to ruin the mood, Mom. When Sebastian arrives, we'll find out. On the sea in the eyebrows, replied the daughter. The long-awaited day came. Sebastian arrived. The young man already a couple of hours after his arrival called Cindy. Cindy happily promised that she would try to get off work early. Miranda looked at her daughter and realized how much Cindy was looking forward to seeing her boyfriend. The woman approached her daughter and said that she was free for the day. The girl gratefully hugged her mother and quickly left the bank. Miranda let her daughter go and wished her happiness mentally. Soon the woman came home. Then Cindy called and said that she would not come to spend the night. This news did not surprise the landlady, as she assumed that this would happen. After all, her daughter had been so much time apart from her favorite person. The next day was Saturday. Miranda woke up and, as usual, looked into Cindy's room, who was not there. The woman looked at the empty bed in bewilderment and immediately slapped herself on the forehead. Miranda had forgotten that this night the daughter was in the company of Sebastian. The landlady then headed to the kitchen to make herself breakfast, and then her cell phone rang. The woman picked up the phone and heard the happy voice of her daughter, Mamulia. Hi, we'll be there soon, wait for us, but I didn't cook anything. You couldn't have warned me from the evening, the mother said confusedly. You don't have to cook anything. We'll bring everything with us. And within a couple hours, Miranda was already meeting her daughter with her young man, who was holding a bouquet of flowers. Sebastian smiled and handed the flowers to the woman. Miranda thanked the man and invited him into the hall, where a table was already set up with a spread of sausage and cheese and several vases of homemade straws. In a few minutes, everyone was already seated at the table. Cindy was merrily counting the many interesting things Sebastian had told her about being abroad. Miranda listened to her daughter and looked furtively at her guest. The woman noted that the young man was handsome and behaved correctly. The landlady liked this fact. Meanwhile, Cindy kept talking and talking, and then she was politely interrupted by Sebastian. Darling, have you forgotten that we brought sushi with us? Maybe we should put them on the table. The girl splashed her hands after the guy's words and went to the hallway, where the grocery bag had been left. Meanwhile, Sebastian turned to the landlady. He said you are interested in a lot of things and I understand that. You can ask me anything you want. I have nothing to hide. Young man, all I care about is the fate of my daughter. Tell me you'll never give her up. No, she's dear to me. And about New Year's Eve, I'm going to celebrate it with you, if you don't mind. I will be grateful to you for this," with a smile replied the woman, 
who did not expect these words from her daughter's lover. Yes, it went by very quickly, and Sebastian went abroad again. But now that Miranda got to know the guy, she felt at ease. She believed that the young man treated her daughter sincerely. Two weeks had passed. After Sebastian left, Cindy was returning home with her mother. They were walking, discussing working moments, as the girl's phone rang. Cindy happily pulled out her cell phone as she thought it was her chosen one calling. But she was mistaken. The girl saw an unknown number. She answered and heard an unfamiliar female voice that said, I can hear Cindy. Yes, you are speaking to me. We need to meet. It's about Sebastian. The stranger spoke quickly and then dictated where to come and what time. Cindy wanted to ask a couple of questions, but the connection on the other end was already disconnected. The girl shrugged her shoulders in bewilderment. Her mother, seeing her daughter's amazement, asked who had called. Cindy said that it was a wrong number. After a while, the girl told Miranda that she had to go out on business. Cindy was puzzled by this call from a stranger, but she did not want to bother her mother for nothing. So she hid from her that she was going to a meeting. The girl hailed a cab and gave the driver the address to go to. The chauffeur looked at the girl with surprise and asked her if she was sure she had to take her there. Cindy answered in the affirmative, and in half an hour the girl was there. She let go of the car and looked around. It was an abandoned construction site. Cindy was surprised that the meeting was scheduled in such a place. Just then the girl saw a foreign car pull up and a brunette woman get out of it. Cindy immediately recognized the young woman. It was Sebastian's wife. Christina leisurely approached the girl and looked at her with disdain. Cindy endured the gaze and coldly inquired as to why this meeting was necessary. Christina grinned, and then she muttered stiffly that she wanted Cindy out of her husband's life forever, and then added, you better not confront me. My father is a lieutenant colonel, and he has the power to do a lot of bad things to those who obey me. Listen, Christina, don't scare me. Sebastian, you're not loved and you know it. Why would you cut off pieces of love when you know your husband's heart belongs to someone else? If I were you, I'd just give him a divorce. As soon as he gets back from his internship, although your desire for a divorce doesn't really matter anymore. That's because Sebastian has already decided he's not going to live with you. How did you find me, by the way? Finding you wasn't a problem. I knew my husband had a woman on the side. He has them a lot. It's just his personality. So don't be fooled into thinking you're his one and only. He'll play with you and leave you. Like he's done with everyone before. If your husband's such a womanizer, then why did you call me here? You said yourself that Sebastian will play with you and dump you, but you don't have to answer that. I'll speak for you. You just realized that Sebastian really loves me and wants to be with me. But you didn't answer my question about how you found me on your husband's phone. I found your number. I take it there's no way to work things out with you. No. Then you're gonna regret it. Christina said angrily. And what will you do to me? Cindy said mockingly. How about this? And with these words, the brunette opened her purse, from where she took out a small vial and with a quick movement, spilled the contents of the bottle on the face of her interlocutor. Cindy screamed and covered her face with her hands. Meanwhile, Christina Evil smirked and spoke. My husband likes beautiful girls, and your face is not as beautiful as it used to be. And don't you dare go to the police. I already told you who my father is. If you don't take my advice, you'll end up in the dock yourself. Now goodbye, girl. Cindy didn't see Christina leave. The girl fell to the ground and screamed loudly in unbearable pain. And then she lost consciousness. Cindy woke up only a few days later in the intensive care unit. The girl wanted to raise her head, but she was pierced by a terrible pain and moaned. Cindy tried to open her eyes, but she failed. At the same moment, a nurse came up to her and mouthed, Awake. That's wonderful. I'll get the doctor now. And you'll talk to him. Soon the doctor came over, who asked the girl a few questions, and then informed her that she would be moved to a room. Before leaving, the man added that Cindy was waiting to talk to the investigator. 
The girl responded by asking how she had ended up in the hospital. The doctor looked thoughtfully at the patient and said, You were brought here by a homeless man who frequents the place. He found you unconscious and carried you in his arms to our hospital. By the way, he's worried about your health and came by to see how you're doing. I must give him credit for not abandoning a man in distress. You could have died of hypothermia. It's hot out, and there are other factors that could have killed you. But it's all behind me now, and I'm glad of it. After a while, the girl was moved to the ward, and Cindy's mother came to see her. The woman rushed to her daughter and hugged her. Miranda stroked the girl's arms and cried silently. Cindy heard Vanya sobs to the mother and asked her to calm down. Miranda tried to hold back her emotions, but she failed. Just then, the door to the room fell open. A man entered. He approached the patient's bed and said softly that he was an investigator and needed to ask some questions. Miranda glared at the stranger and said, Can't you see the girl's condition? She doesn't need your questions right now. I understand perfectly well, but now you listen to me. There's a lot of time wasted with Cindy unconscious and the perpetrator still at large. The sooner I find out what happened that day, the more likely we are to catch this scoundrel and put him behind bars. It's in your best interest, said the Miranda man, and then turned to Cindy. Tell us what happened that day. Please be focused in detail when you recall. Every little detail is important to us. I don't remember anything. An unknown person threw something in my face and then darkness. Cindy said weakly, and that's all you remember. What were you doing in that neighborhood, and what did this person look like? I was just walking around. I told you everything I know. That's all I have to tell you. Can I ask you to leave me alone? I'm very tired. The man looked intently at the victim's mother and asked her to go out into the corridor with him. Here, the investigator told Miranda to try to persuade her daughter to cooperate with the investigation and to try to find out from the girl what had happened that day. The woman nodded silently and headed for the room. Miranda walked over to her daughter and sat down next to her. She stroked her daughter's hands and quietly told Cindy to try to think only of the good times right now. The girl replied muffledly that all she had to do was wait for the bandage to be removed, to look at her face and then she could enjoy life. The visitor interrupted her daughter and spoke out. Let's not talk about it now. Better tell me what you were doing at the abandoned construction site and who threw acid in your face. Please don't lie to me, because I know you went there on purpose and you saw the face of the perpetrator who did it. Mom, from now on, this is a closed matter and please don't bring it up again. Cindy was in the hospital for over a month. During this time, the girl did not communicate with her roommate and tried to keep to herself. And when she saw her reflection in the mirror, she withdrew into herself. The doctor noticed that the patient was in a depressed state and before discharge told the girl and her mother to remove the scars as possible, but it will require several expensive operations. Now the change of appearance is only in your hands and we on our part did everything we could. After being discharged from the hospital, Cindy quit her job, and she also changed her SIAM card number. Miranda could not understand why her daughter had done this and asked her directly about it. The girl looked at her mother and without emotion said with such a face only to scare children, not to go to work. I changed my SIAM card because I don't want to communicate with Sebastian anymore. Are you afraid that Sebastian won't want to deal with you because you have scars on your face. If a man loves, he won't care about that. Because they don't love you for your looks. I don't want anything to do with him. And that's the end of it. And in general, I do not want to live without emotions, said the daughter. What are you talking about? Have you thought about me? The woman said excitedly. Miranda was worried about her daughter's state of mind after this conversation. She was afraid that Cindy might do something irreparable. Then one day the woman came home and saw a pile of pills on the table in the kitchen. Miranda cried out and ran to her daughter's room, where she saw the girl lying on the bed. The woman ran up to Cindy, slowed her down. The one opened her eyes and said that everything was fine, and she had not taken medication, 
but wanted to do so. Miranda realized after this incident that something had to be done, and then she decided that it was necessary to put her daughter in the clinic and do plastic surgery. For this purpose, the woman withdrew her savings and went to a famous specialist. The doctor examined the girl and said that the appearance can be returned, but only not the same as it was before. When Cindy heard this, she said, I don't need my past appearance. Soon Cindy was admitted to a clinic where the first surgery was performed. Then rehabilitation care was required, for which finances were also needed. Miranda had nothing left to do, how to take out a loan, but the money was just enough to pay for the care, and more surgeries were needed. So Miranda turned to her daughter, you and I have one way out, sell the apartment and move to another city where we will buy a one-room apartment and the rest of the money will be used for the operation and the loan repayment. Mom, but you and I are going to live in poverty. Is that the most important thing? You're more important to me now. The decision was unanimous. The girl's mother said firmly and then hugged her daughter tenderly. Cindy was glad that they would soon leave this town for she knew that Sebastian would soon arrive. And that was the only reason she had talked her mother into not delaying the sale of the apartment. Miranda understood why her daughter asked her to sell the property as soon as possible. And as a result, a deal was soon made. The apartment was sold for next to nothing. And Cindy and her mother moved to a provincial town. After that, Miranda got a job again and put her daughter in the clinic for another operation. And I realized that they were going to be struggling financially right now so I took a part-time job. She started doing bookkeeping at one of the small firms. A couple years went by. During that time, Cindy had two more surgeries, and now the girl was with a completely different face from the same old Cindy she had been before. Miranda was happy for her daughter that now her girl could start her life with a new leaf, and Cindy at one time was grateful to her mother for going to any lengths just to give her back the meaning of life. And one day a conversation took place between mother and daughter, the initiator of which was the girl. Mammy, tell me, you do not regret anything that, for example, left the megalopolis in this backwoods just to give me back my face. That's silly. That's my girl. If I had to make another decision, I'd do the same thing. When you're a mom, you'll understand. Maybe I will someday, which I doubt, the girl said sadly. Okay. Openness for openness. When you got acid thrown at you, it was because of Sebastian. Yes. Why didn't you tell the investigator? The mother asked quietly. We wouldn't have been able to prove anything. Christina's father works in law enforcement, and I was also afraid that Sebastian would get hurt. That's what I thought, and you still love him. Soon Cindy got a job, too, and life slowly moved on. Miranda hoped that all their sorrows were behind them now. How did her heart begin to ache? Doctors immediately said that it was necessary to quit one job, as it was an additional load on the main organ of life. The woman had no choice but to leave her position as an accountant in the firm. Cindy was glad that her mother had quit her second job. The girl now wanted her mother to not need anything, but she realized that with their salaries, they wouldn't get far. Cindy knew they were not poor, but she wanted her mother to be able to go to the sea and relax. So after work, she told Miranda, I want to go to my father's house. I've been in touch with a classmate. She told me he started a second company. I'm gonna go and shake his wallet. Back in the day, my dad promised he helped me, but not until I turned 18. He just disappeared from my life. I don't need to do this. Let that man live his life and I still have a grudge against him in my soul, and I want to spill it. Years later, the girl said sadly, that's bad that you cannot let go of resentment against your father. The mother replied sadly. A week later, Cindy told her mother that she was leaving for another city. Miranda realized that her daughter was going to the place where they had lived before. The woman tried to stop Cindy, but she was adamant. The girl explained that she would try to get a job as an accountant and earn more money so that next year they could go to the sea together. And already Cindy is in another city. She rented a room and went to look for a job. 
she was lucky. On her first day, she read an advertisement for an accountant in a firm that had recently opened. Cindy arrived at the appointed address and was met by the deputy director. The young man questioned the girl about her work experience and then called the boss and told him that a young woman had come to get a job as an accountant. Soon, Cindy got a job in a travel agency. The girl quickly got acquainted with the staff, which was not numerous. The staff consisted of only seven people. Cindy learned that the firm had been in existence for a relatively short time. In a week's time, it would be a year since it had opened. The girl inquired of one of the female employees, why is there no director in place? And she laughed, answered that the boss is here very rarely. A few days passed, and the deputy director announced that the day after tomorrow, there is a corporate party on the occasion of the anniversary of the opening of the company. The entire staff amicably piled up the shot. After all, this meant that it was possible to have fun. Meanwhile, the deputy director went on to say that it was necessary to appear in dress uniform and finally added that the supervisor would be attending the party. Cindy was curious to see for the first time her immediate director, who had hired her without even looking at her once. And so this day of the corporate party came. At the end of the working day, the office staff began to set the table. The appetizer was ordered in one of the cafes. And now when the courier brought the order, then all merrily displayed appetizers on the table. There was a relaxed atmosphere in the room while preparing everything for the party. One of the employees told a funny anecdote and everyone present laughed. And soon the deputy director invited everyone to take a seat at the table. He called the boss and informed him that the boss would be a little late and asked him to start without him. One of the employees dashingly filled glasses and raised a toast to the prosperity of the tourism business. Everyone cheered, supported him and emptied the flute. Then the deputy director took the role of Toastmaster and asked to fill the glasses again. The young man only wanted to make a speech as the door to the room fell off and the director entered. The man welcomed everyone and said, and I can have a splash. I want to celebrate with you. Cindy looked at the entered man and felt that her body was pierced as if by hundreds of needles. The girl recognized the man immediately. She suppressed the exclamation within her and lowered her eyes. Cindy tried to calm her breathing. In the meantime, the boss came in and seeing the new employee, exclaimed what beauties we have working for us. I'll sit next to the new girl with my staff. We have to be on the same footing. And then the fun began. One toast after another followed. Everyone cheerfully applauded every speech. And meanwhile, on the floor of the exhausted new boss dragged her into the office, where he closed the door on the lock. After that, the man began to carefully undo the buttons on the white blouse. And then he saw a familiar scar on her chest. The owner of the office was confused. He had seen such a scar in the form of a triangle only on one girl. Cindy, seeing how dumbfounded the man was, she said in an inebriated voice, What are you, Sebastian? He stopped. Go on. Cindy, well, it's impossible. I've been looking all over for you. I can see how I've looked. Now I can only see that you are late female employees and then drag to your office to have fun. With a grin said the girl. Then she lowered her head and fell asleep. The girl woke up on the couch. She threw the blanket and saw that she was wearing the same clothes that she had worn at the corporate party. The girl looked around and immediately recognized the setting. This was Sebastian's apartment. Cindy tried to get up, but immediately felt her head split in two. She groaned involuntarily and closed her eyes, and at the same moment she caught the smell of fresh emergency coffee. The girl opened her eyes again and saw Sebastian in front of her, who was holding her nose. The young man walked over and knelt down in front of the guest, and then the man handed the girl a cup of coffee and offered to bolster her strength. The girl refused the huge drink and asked for a glass of plain water. Hearing Cindy's request, Sebastian laughed and said that yesterday she had too much to drink. This statement made the girl angry, and the guest said, Didn't you pour me some water yesterday? You greased his face and his tail. 
and fanning his tail. I won't deny it, but I've lost myself. I'm a man, and I'm not a stranger to humanity. If you were with me, I wouldn't need any woman. Now tell me what happened. Although I know what happened, I'm interested in something else. Why haven't you been in touch with me? How do you know what happened that day? Did you stop answering me? Your number was out of range. As soon as I arrived, I went straight to your place. But there were new tenants. I went to the neighbors who told me someone threw acid in your face. And then you and your mom, in a hurry, sold the apartment and moved out. It wasn't hard to find out who the perpetrator was. I went straight to my wife, and she confessed. She thought I was going to live with her after that, but I filed for divorce. That's my whole story, and now it's your turn. Do you remember my question? What's your answer? I didn't want to live then. You should have seen me at that moment. People looked away from me in horror. You can't imagine how hard it was to bear. And then my mom decided she was going to do whatever it took to make sure I could move on. So she sold the apartment. And with the money, I had several plastic surgeries. You joined my firm on purpose. No, I didn't even know you owned the firm. I just came to earn money here because the salary is higher than in our provincial town. When I saw you, I was stunned. I was really shocked at that moment. And when you started calling me again, I hated you. I mean, your wife said you were a womanizer. And now it's kind of true. Christina always had a way of slandering me. I only cheated on her twice during my marriage. One time was when I was drunk. And the second time, you already know that you and I were intimate. I told you before that I've been without a woman's affection for a long time. Now tell me, what should we do with you? I've been thinking about you all this time. I could have started a family many times, but I didn't. Somewhere subconsciously I was waiting to meet you. Cindy listened to Sebastian in silence. She could see that at this moment, the man was speaking sincerely. The young woman sat down on the couch and took Sebastian's head with her hands held it out to her, and then kissed him on the lips. The girl didn't care about anything right now. She wanted to be in the arms of this man. And in a few minutes the couple lay in each other's arms. They enjoyed the passion that possessed them. And only after a while were able to tear themselves away from each other. Young people lay and breathed heavily. And then Sebastian embraced the woman, and looking into her eyes, asked, Will you marry me? I guess I don't know. Laughing, the girl said, Oh, that's how you are. I'm seriously proposing marriage to her, and she's laughing. Now I will bite you everywhere with deliberate seriousness, said the man and began to shower his beloved with tender kisses. Afterwards, the couple had a long talk with each other. Cindy learned that Sebastian, after the divorce, took a loan and organized a travel agency where he is very rarely, since there is still his main job. He said that he had taken a job teaching French at a university. The young people would still talk for a long time. But then, Cindy's phone rang. The girl answered it as she heard the voice of Sebastian's deputy, who sternly pronounced that she was late for work. The landlord, hearing this, laughed and picked up Cindy's phone, and then informed her that the employee was out on vacation, and it was being decided whether she would want to work at all. After this call, the man turned to his lover and said that they were going to visit Cindy's mother the other day, as soon as he had settled his affairs, and then buy tickets and go all together to the sea. The girl looked at the chosen one and thought that perhaps fate had given them a second chance to be together forever. And after that, Cindy called her mom, and as soon as she heard her voice, she mumbled, You said some time ago that you should be warned in advance. If I'm going with my lover, that's what I'm doing now. We're coming with Sebastian this week. He sends his love to you. So, Mammy, take a vacation, and we'll all go to the sea together. By the way, your future son-in-law said he doesn't accept any objections. I think this news made you happy. You don't even know how much. I love you, my family. With tears in her eyes from happiness, said the woman. subscribe and click the bell. It seemed to her that she would always be among the losers, 
but it was just an episode in her life. Five years of school are behind her. Tomorrow was the graduation ceremony. Kelly couldn't believe this was it. The next thing was sailing on her own. Some of the girls were able to arrange jobs in advance. When internships were held in schools, Kelly was also offered by the director of the Lyceum, where she worked for a month and a half in the fifth year. Only more hustling classmate Betty has already hustled and first applied to that Lyceum, and there she was gladly taken. But Kelly was not discouraged. She'd find a job for sure, and now graduation. Her dorm roommates had curlers on from the night before. Everyone wanted to look beautiful for graduation. But Kelly does not need any curlers. Her hair is naturally thick, curly, straight brown waterfall. In general, Kelly is beautiful, brown eyes, light skin, slender, like a twig. The girls even envy her a little. Kelly, you don't have to work at all. Why do you want to go to school? Kathy said, you just wink at some millionaire and he'll call you to the registry office. Yeah, by the leg. Kelly waved me off. What do I need millionaires for? They're all fat, bald. What's that all of a sudden? The girls laughed, because while he was making his millions, the years passed. And I don't need millionaire girls. I want to meet my love. Kelly confessed, just once and for all. Who doesn't dream of that? Nancy sighed. That's what I want, too. But that's just the way it is in the movies. In life, wherever you look, all the guys are either some kind of underachievers, or how can I put it mildly? They're not interested in girls. Oh, Nancy, you like to exaggerate everything. Lisa disagreed with her. I'm like Kelly. I believe my soulmate is out there somewhere. And the girls chatted and chatted, forgetting the time. And when they looked at the clock, they gasped. It's two o'clock in the morning. Tomorrow's presentation at 10 o'clock. Urgent, all to bed. And in the morning, the room was in turmoil. The girls painted eyelashes, did each other's hair, dressed up, and then all rushed, clacking their heels down the stairs. Wendy the janitor saw them off with a smile. Wondering how fast time had flown by, just yesterday, these girls were very young, and today they were so beautiful. It was crowded at the award ceremony. Yesterday's students, teachers, parents. Kelly looked at her classmates with a little sadness at whose parents were able to come. Her friend's moms had come too, and Nancy's dad, an important man in a jacket. And no one came to Kelly's. There was no one. The year Kelly went to college, her mom was gone. She was the only relative in the girl's life, and it so happened that she raised Kelly alone and never said a word about her father, neither bad nor good, as if he was not even in nature. Kelly and her mother lived in a small working village without anyone's help and support, and when her mom was gone, Kelly didn't even want to go to school and only her mother's words shortly before she left prevented her from doing so. You, my daughter, go here, get an education. In this life, you only need to rely on yourself. Mom said the day before, as if she had a premonition of something. And forgive me, I'm not a good helper. And that's the only time she ever mentioned her father, like Kelly. He's a big name in town. He must be in a position of power somewhere. And that was it. By morning, Mom was gone. Kelly overcame herself and went away to study. It was hard for her without support and only payments for loss of breadwinners saved and also worked part-time girl in a night stall in the dormitory. That's how she lived. And she didn't look for her father. Somehow she didn't gather her courage. And how could she look for him? She will not be all brown-eyed, dark-haired, famous people suspect paternity. Let her live as she knows how. Did not know about her for so many years, and now do not need. Kelly was distracted from sad thoughts by fanfare. 
The rector came out, then the dean. They said something, said something. Then the awarding of diplomas. Everything went great. After the newly minted specialists, the whole company rushed to the embankment in a street cafe. So they decided to spend their studentship simply and cheerfully, and all succeeded. Late at night, standing by the river, the girls dreamed. Now all roads are open before them. A new and happy life was ahead of them, and in a week they had to move out of the dormitory. It was easier for Nancy and Lisa. Their parents had rented apartments for them. Kathy had moved in with her aunt temporarily. But Kelly had a lot of work to do. She couldn't just rent an apartment. She just didn't have the money. So she looked for an apartment, and the janitor helped her. Grandma Wendy had a relative who lived downtown. Her younger sister had recently buried her husband. Her kids have their own lives, and she has a four-bedroom apartment. Can you believe it? That's what Wendy's grandma said. That's a lot of utility bills. She keeps complaining to me that half of her money is spent on the bills. She says we should get a tenant, so she asked me to find her a place. And maybe I'm not suitable for her. Kelly sighed. And how much will she charge me? Oh, don't worry. Waved his hands, janitoress. You will get along with her. She, of course, a woman with a temper. Not for nothing that all her life married to the chief of police was, and with her older son does not communicate, although he lives in the city. But that's their personal affairs. So she is quite adequate. And will not take much. You'll see. There was nothing to do. Kelly agreed. The same day she went to the address Wendy had given her. The door was opened by a woman about sixty years old in a Chinese kimono, with some impossible hairstyle on her head. In her arms was a bald cat. Kelly, seeing the animal, even shuddered. She didn't understand why they had to have such monsters, but she didn't let on. She introduced herself, explained why she was here. Yes, Wendy told me. The woman answered with a yawn. Come in. My name is Vanessa. The apartment was lavish, the kind of furnishings Kelly had only seen in movies, and she was confused. And the landlady didn't have enough to pay the utilities. Anyway, here we go. Vanessa began scratching her sphinx behind the ear. I won't charge you anything for the room. Only the utilities will be shared, and you'll also help me around the house, clean, cook, go to the store, go and look after Tom. If anything, Tom. Kelly was surprised. Yes, for Tom. Vanessa replied defiantly and pointed at the cat. Or do you think he has a bad name? No, do you? Kelly nodded in confusion. It's a good name, and he's a very nice cat. Although, to be honest, the name Tom in her mind suggested a different animal—a fluffy, fat cat, like she and Mom used to have, but not this one, like the chicken in the store. What can you do? It wasn't the animal's fault. Kelly smiled. Cute kitty, cute kitty, cute. Vanessa's smile blossomed into a smile. The cat meowed something unhappily in response. Okay, let's go. I'll show you your room. But Vanessa, you know that I'm getting a job. I can only help you in the evenings. Get a job, Vanessa shrugged. We'll adjust your schedule so you can get everywhere. Kelly was a little embarrassed that the woman had already planned everything for her, but she had no choice because Kelly had to live somewhere. The room was the smallest in the apartment, but it was cozy. There were no expensive things here. Everything was simple and practical, and Kelly was fine with that. Vanessa explained that her housekeeper had lived here for a while, and then she quit. I've been on my own with Tom ever since. Vanessa sighed. Do you know how hard it is to be alone? Come on, get settled in. And in an hour we'll have tea. And exactly an hour later they were sitting in the kitchen. 
Vanessa said that after her husband was gone, she was very lonely, and the children had all gone away. Vanessa sighed. The daughter lives abroad, the younger son in New York, and the eldest? Well, God be with him. He's fine. Kelly realized that there was some family problem, but it was somehow not tactful to ask for more details, so she didn't say anything. Vanessa's tea was delicious, and the service was so beautiful. It was the first time Kelly drank tea from such beautiful cups. Her husband had brought them back from a business trip. I don't remember where he went. Vanessa explained, noticing Kelly looking at the patterns on the cup. Real Chinese porcelain. Well, we've had our tea, and that's enough. Why don't you tidy up the place and be careful with the cups? Tom and I are going to go and have a rest. And she and the cat, who sat in her arms like a wooden one, left the kitchen and looked in again. Then washed the window here, because something dusty already. Badly last week. Probably, the housekeeper cleaned. And also go to the store. I'll make you a list. And I also need to water the flowers in the living room and loosen them. Oh, it's the other way around. Vanessa, I have to go to the dorms to get my stuff. Kelly barely got a word in between the hostess's instructions. You'll do everything, and then you'll go. Vanessa shrugged her lips. I'll remind you that you're living here for free, so you have to help me for that. Kelly nodded in response. What to do? She had no other option. She would have to adjust to Vanessa. In the evening, Kelly finally went to the dormitory to get her things. Grandma Wendy was on watch. So, Kelly, are you talking to Vanessa? When she saw the girl, the old lady was the first to speak. I did. Kelly nodded tiredly. I see she's already filling you with errands. Wendy grinned. Oh, sister, she's used to having everyone running around her. Don't be mad, baby. I just want what's best for you. She's not bad. You just have to find an approach to her. Kelly just smiled back. And Wendy herself, I wondered if she'd found an approach to her sister. But come on, it's not like living on the street. What a nice place. The next day, Kelly decided to go to the nearest schools in the neighborhood. Maybe she'd get lucky. At the first school, they looked at her like she was an alien. What are the stakes? We've been staffed for years, only professionals. At the second school, they asked for her diploma. Oh, you have a C for literature? The principal exclaimed, looking at the diploma insert. You coped with the university program, and now you want to work in a school. What will you teach your children? This is the only C. Kelly replied with a grudge, and I got it the first time, while others took it three times. And I'm not interested in others. With a grin replied the principal. You came to us. It is not known whether you really studied. Maybe you bought a diploma in the crosswalk. That was too much, but Kelly just flashed a glare, said nothing and left, slamming the door. Seize. You'd think that only those who graduated with a red diploma would work at this very ordinary school. Kelly was moved to tears by the unfounded accusations. She had studied conscientiously for five years, was one of the most successful students in the course, and here some nasty suspicions, say, bought a diploma. Why are they talking to her like that? In the third school, she found the answer to this question. The administration wasn't there, but the words of the eager technician explained everything to Kelly. What are you, sweetie? No one will take you from the street, said the woman when she heard that Kelly was looking for a job. They have their own rules here, matchmaker, brother, neighbor, and so on. Besides, the old teachers take two jobs and will never give them to anyone in their life. It's only on TV they say that young people don't go to school, but in reality they have all taken their places and can't be moved. Kelly listened to the woman and felt so sad. Why did she go to school? 
and what a fool she had been. After all, the director of the Lyceum offered her a job then, and she still thought. Now it's too late. Back in the apartment, Kelly immediately received an assignment to take out the trash, take things to the dry cleaners, and go to the pharmacy for vitamins for the cat. Kelly, get exactly the vitamins I wrote down. Vanessa held out a piece of paper with the name of the medication and the money. Kelly nodded tiredly and left the apartment again. She wanted to get some rest after running around school. Her head hurt a little. The girl swallowed the pill and quickened her step. Now she would do everything, go back to her room and lie down. What did you buy? Vanessa was indignant when Kelly returned and gave her the jar of vitamins and the change. It's a different manufacturer. But the pharmacy said there was no difference. It had the same ingredients. Kelly objected. How much do you understand? These pills make Tom dizzy. Kelly shrugged her shoulders and laughed to herself. How did Vanessa know that Tom was dizzy? Had he told her that? But her mood soured when Vanessa told her that in addition to the utility bills, Kelly now owed for those vitamins. Vanessa, I haven't even earned a penny yet. The girl almost begged. I'll pay it all back, only a little later. And I wondered where they would take you such a foolish girl. Vanessa grinned back. You know what, girl? You should make up your mind. I'm not doing charity work. Oh, by the way, do the dishes in the kitchen. And she and the cat went to her room. And Kelly stared at the sink full of dishes. When had that woman gotten so many dishes dirty? Kelly had left the kitchen perfectly clean this morning. And somehow it's strange. In fact, she performs the functions of a housekeeper and she has to pay for accommodation. Food was out of the question. Kelly ate in the canteen, and here in the apartment only tea and drank. After a week, the girl realized that she and Vanessa would not be able to live under the same roof for long. Instructions came like from the Horn of Plenty, as soon as Kelly stepped over the threshold. And then there's the ridicule. What kind of school is this? The landlady liked to say, scrubbing floors, that's what you do. And you're a troublemaker, just like my eldest son. He's a troublemaker too. All his life he was fussing, looking for a better life, not listening to his mother. And now what? Kelly wouldn't listen to her, but Vanessa went on. He was looking for love, and then he found himself an otter. He wouldn't listen to his mother. He lives with her, almost never comes to see me. Once a year, he checks if she's still alive. It's fine that he got a higher education. He's still a fool. And so are you. What's the use of your diploma when you don't know anything about life? What do I know? Kelly asked resentfully. For this life with teeth should be grasped and where necessary and go over the heads. And you don't have it in you. You're spineless. Listening to Vanessa's insults, the girl did not want to listen anymore. She gathered her things, threw the key on the nightstand in the hallway, and went to the exit. What a touchy one. Vanessa shouted goodbye to her. Look, what a princess. Callie didn't answer her. And only when she jumped out of the entrance, sat on a bench and cried. Maybe Vanessa was right. You have to go head to head in this life, but is it the right thing to do? Her mom always said that one should respect another person's opinion, be more tolerant, show kindness of heart. And what happened? Her mom was just over 40 when she died. She never hurt anyone in her life. She worked in a village school and that was it. She didn't achieve anything. They even had a service apartment. After her mother died and she was taken away, Kelly herself also tried to live according to her conscience. But there was always a brazen grasp ahead. Become like that? No, disgusting. Kelly can't. What is it, sweetheart? Are you from Vanessa's? From apartment 12? 
She heard a woman's voice and looked up. There was an old lady standing next to her, a dandelion of a woman. Callie nodded back. The old woman had fooled another girl again. The old woman sighed and sat down next to her, and then she told her story. It turns out that Vanessa has been practicing this for a long time. She finds girls who urgently need a place to live. Most often she finds such girls through acquaintances, so that they were decent, and as if for free, but loads her with so much work that the housekeeper has to work there from dawn to dusk. And the girls have their own lives and their main job. Some will live a month, some two. There was one who lasted about a year. But you, baby, you're just a newcomer. Yeah, a little over a week. Kelly nodded. But I can't go any longer. That's right. I can't stand that woman. She's been bossy all her life. Her husband was only a boss at work, but at home he was her boss. Her children, she has three of them. The younger ones ran away from her as soon as they were on their feet. And the eldest, William, was always Vanessa's sort of unloved son, but he did everything for her and took her groceries and medicine, she said. And then she got fed up with him and started divorcing him and his wife. Not only that in his youth, the man did not give life, all the bride he was looking for more profitable bride, and here she began, in general, he broke up with his mother in a puff of smoke and dust. He hasn't come to visit for a year now, but he calls, that's for sure. He sends her food and money through his driver. Vanessa keeps crying, saying she's poor and unhappy. She's insolent. Let her live with her bald man and her cat. And you, little girl, are right not to put up with it. It's better to live on the street than with such a landlady. Said the old lady and went to the entrance, and Kelly only smiled sadly. It's good to think like that when you have a place to live. But what should she do? She decided to call her friends. Nancy was very happy when she heard her friend and immediately bragged that her father had arranged a job for her as a secretary in one of the institutions of the city. Nancy, I don't have a place to live. Kelly shared her distress. No way. That's the trouble. Oh, but I don't know what I can do to help you. Can I stay with you for a few days? I'll find something later. I've got some money left over from my old job at the stall. I think I can find something cheap. Oh, really? Nancy exclaimed. Kelly, I'd love to, but I can't. When they rented out my apartment, the owners told me not to have any guests, because you know what neighbors are like, they'll rat you out. Okay, I'm sorry to bother you, Nancy. No, it's fine. You call me if you need anything. And Nancy disconnected the phone first. There you go. Kelly grinned sadly. One less friend, but Lisa shouldn't say no, she's easier. Where's it going? Lisa, as soon as she heard Kelly's problem, told her that she had already met a great guy, and now he was living at her place, and the apartment was a studio. Once again, Kelly apologized for disturbing the peace of her friend. She fervently wished the girl to solve all her problems soon. Kelly, I'm sure everything will be fine. You just keep your head up. You will definitely, definitely everything will work out. Lisa said. Kelly was the first to interrupt the conversation. She didn't really want to call Kathy. They'd always gotten on a little better somehow. Kathy is mocking, sarcastic even. Kelly was always a little uncomfortable with her remarks, but she called. What are you crying about? Kathy exclaimed when she heard Kelly sniffle as she recounted her misfortune. Well, get on the first bus and go to the end of the line. I'll meet you at the stop. Kathy, what about your aunt? Kelly asked shyly. She wouldn't like having a stranger in the apartment. My aunt Miranda is a worldly woman. Of course we'll be a little cramped, but we'll get by. I can't just leave you on the street. We're friends. Thank you, Kathy. Sneeze again, Kelly. 
I thought you'd say no, too. What do you mean, too? So, Nancy, did Lisa call yet? Rats. Kathy was outraged. Well, to hell with them. Let them go on with their lives. But you go to my place. Soon the girls met at the bus stop, hopped each other, and Kelly was met at the apartment by a young and pretty woman, about 30 years old. And this is my aunt. Kathy introduced her with a smile. Aunt Miranda, my mom's younger sister. Oh, Kathy, if you call me auntie again, I'll drag you away by your ears. The relative laughed with a white-toothed smile. I'm Miranda. I think there used to be such a series. Kelly smiled. Oh, baby, my life is cooler than any show. Miranda laughed. And then the three of them drank tea in the kitchen and talked about nothing. Kelly was melting her soul. Yes, she'd been wrong about Kathy. Kathy was the only one to give her a helping hand in a difficult situation, and Miranda was so friendly. My auntie would give any man a head start. Kathy whispered to Kelly in the late afternoon when they were already asleep on the sofa. She's a racer. A racer? How come you never told me about her before? Yes, she and my mother quarreled more than 10 years ago. My mother and grandparents wanted her to continue the family tradition. She also went to the pedagogical institute, and Miranda sent everyone far away and got a job in the city in a cafe as a waitress. Then she met her first husband, and he left her this apartment when they separated. By then she opened a little store. She started selling car parts, not groceries. She met a customer at the store, a professional race car driver. He became her second husband. She started riding with him, and then she split up with him. But they're still friends, unlike the first one. They continue to participate in all sorts of motorsport competitions together. And the store? It's a store. Miranda runs it, and she hired me as a sales girl. Kathy, you went into sales? I don't understand. Why did you go to college? You sound just like my mother, higher education and all that. What do I need that education for? To earn pennies? No. I'll earn much more here, and I like it. Maybe you'll find yourself a racing driver husband, too. It's not out of the question. And the girls laughed, so much so that Miranda from the next room said sleepily, Girls, it's nighttime. Kelly and Kathy fell silent, but for a long time they whispered about their own girlish things. In the morning they went about their business. Kelly decided to go to school again, as she had another school in mind. The principal, a middle-aged man, received her immediately. He looked at her silently for a long time while she explained how she loved children and dreamed of working at the school. But he didn't even look at her diploma. Do you have a medical book? The principal asked with interest. Yes, of course. Kelly nodded. And you went through everything there? All the tests? The gynecologist? The director licked his lips and grinned wickedly. All of them, Kelly answered, and she herself just shuddered from his grin and prickly eyes. We'll then come back tomorrow, write an application. We'll take you to social pedagogues. Why social pedagogues? I'm an English teacher. Well, we only have a social pedagogue position available, but if you and I work together, we'll see what we can do. Kelly nodded and stormed out of the office. The girl cried with embarrassment and indignation. Is that what he was implying now, this principal? What a horror! She would never set foot in that school again as long as there were such leaders. After that, Kelly sat in the park for a long time thinking. Maybe she was going down the wrong road. If she couldn't get a job at her school, then maybe she shouldn't. Maybe Kathy was right to go to work at the store. And as if on purpose, on her way home, she saw an ad on the door of one of the supermarkets announcing that they needed sales clerks and cashiers. She immediately went in and asked about the vacancy and was gladly hired. One more salesperson in this world. 
Miranda joked. When she found out where Kelly had gotten the job, you're doing the right thing. You've got to be able to move on in this life. Yeah, one more salesman, and somewhere out there in another life crying, unrecognized teacher. Kathy picked up on that. It's okay, life is long, maybe I'll work in a school, but for now I have to earn a living. I can't stay with you forever, answered Kelly. Yes, Kelly, you're doing the right thing. Miranda agreed. No, I'm not hounding you, but you have your own life. So, Auntie, should I look for something for myself, too? Jokingly asked Kathy. Oh, Kathy, I still have to marry you, and then you'll move out. And there, you'll see in my parents and your mother. For this good deed, I will thank me. You're looking for a millionaire. Kathy wouldn't stop. Yeah, now a millionaire. I'll need one myself. The aunt and her niece joked and laughed heartily, and Kelly laughed with them. So easily and quickly they were suddenly friends, and Kathy opened up to her in a new way. A true friend, one of three left. Kelly blended into the new team quickly and easily. Working in the trade was already familiar to her. Of course, there was a big store, but the principle of work had not changed. Be polite, smile, and keep an eye on the availability of goods. Kelly didn't get a job at the cash register right away. I had to work in the sales area, but after a month or so, the girl sat behind the cash register. Here was more responsible, but Kelly was not afraid. She knew how to count money. With customers was friendly. Once before closing time, a young man ran into the store, quickly dived between the rows, and in just a minute was at the cash register. Just a sprinter. Kelly smiled to herself and punched a can of drink. 120, she said. The guy reached into his pocket for his wallet, his face stretched out. Did I leave my wallet at home? He mumbled confusedly. Young lady, you wait, please. I'll run to get the money. I'm not far away. I live next door. We are already closing. Monotonously for Kelly, answered her partner Molly. Come back tomorrow, young man. Yes, I need to now. I'll fall asleep without energy, and I still have half the night to work. And what do you work? Kelly asked me. I'm nothing important, answered the guy, continuing to feel his pockets in the hope of finding at least some change. But if it's not important, then all the more so. Molly said firmly. Molly, wait. Kelly stopped her gently and turned to the guy. I have already punched the goods anyway. Let me put my money in now, and you'll bring it to me tomorrow? I work in the morning. The guy nodded gratefully in response and vowed to be at the store at 9 o'clock tomorrow. Kelly, are you stupid? Molly asked her. As soon as the guy disappeared with the purchase, you do realize you gave this guy his shopping spree, right? I think he's coming. With a smile, Kelly replied, I can see he's honest. They're all honest as long as they want something. Molly grinned. You're a simple soul, and if you keep doing that, you'll be working for thanks. But I was wrong, Molly. In the morning at exactly nine o'clock, as promised, the guy was already in the store. He gave Kelly the money and then held out a modest bouquet of chrysanthemums. Here you go. Oh, come on. Kelly was embarrassed. No, you don't. Yes, you do. The guy was staring at Kelly with his eyes wide open. Such a beautiful girl deserves to be given flowers every day. My name's Kevin, by the way. Kelly, I know. The guy smiled, nodding at his name tag, and the two of them laughed merrily. In the evening, Kevin waited for Kelly outside the store, walked her home, and told her about himself. He, like Kelly, had come to the city from the country. He was good at sports at school, especially good at soccer. He went to a physical education technical school. 
At first, he played in a soccer team for his school, then for the city. He went to various competitions, showed great promise, and then an injury. And now he works at a sports school as a coach. You said yesterday you were working nights. Kelly remembered. Hey, Kevin brushed it off. Yes, I watch the matches. It's very important for my work. I watch, I memorize. I see. Kelly nodded. Good for you. You work by profession anyway, and I'm a teacher of English language and literature, and I sit at the cash register. So you're a teacher? Kevin was surprised. We're almost colleagues? Sort of. Kelly laughed. They agreed to meet the next night and said goodbye, just shaking hands. Kathy, I met such a cute guy. Kelly was telling her friend. He's a soccer player. Wow. Miranda overheard and jumped in. What team does he play on? He doesn't play on any team. He works at a sports school now. Kelly shrugged. He's a great guy. Dude, they're all great until they get their way. Kathy sighed. You'd better be careful with him. Get to know him first. You sound just like your mommy. Kelly dismissed it. No, Kathy's right. Miranda agreed with her niece. Who knows about that athlete? Before you know it, you'll be with child. And your soccer player will be out of the picture. I wasn't thinking of anything like that. Kelly blushed. You should think about it. Miranda said instructively. Okay, girls, let's go to sleep. Kelly couldn't sleep half the night, thinking about Kevin. No, he's nice. He's really nice. Soon they started dating. Kevin was staying in a friend's house, too. After a bit of thinking, they decided to rent a small apartment, old, unrenovated, almost without furniture. There was only a sofa, a table, and an old refrigerator. But it was cheap. Miranda and Kathy helped Kelly make some minor repairs and left, making her promise that if anything went wrong, they'd kick Kevin to the curb. Kelly promised, even though she knew she wouldn't send him away, because she loved him with all her heart. And a couple months later, they signed, simply, without guests and outfits, decided that the money is not enough. Why splurge? especially since Kevin's parents are old and live far away. Kelly has no family at all. Miranda and Kathy have gotten distant lately. They've got their own lives. Better save up for a down payment on a mortgage. They were thinking of buying this place in the future. So what if it's old? They'll renovate it. They had a real honeymoon. Or rather, a week when they got time off work. No, they didn't go abroad or to the sea. They just had a good time together. They walked around the city, rode the river streetcars, just enjoyed each other. And Kelly, that was enough. The first problem started when Kevin got into trouble at work. One of his students was injured during warm-ups, and Kevin was blamed for it. Oversight. The kid had powerful parents, and Kevin was fired. Kelly was the main target, but she took it calmly because she was sure that Kevin will soon find a new job. And what happened at the old one was just an unfortunate misunderstanding. A month went by. Kevin couldn't find anything. Why don't you try being a security guard? Kelly suggested it. There's an opening at our store. Are you kidding me? That's when Kevin got mad. I'm an athlete first and foremost, and you're telling me to sit around. No, I've got a couple other options. They should call soon. But no one called him. Kevin sat on the couch all day, watching TV, more and more soccer games, coming home from work at night. Kelly would start washing dirty dishes in the sink, cooking dinner, cleaning up. On her timid remarks, say, you can do something around the house for the day. Kevin replied that this is not a man's work. And why did I marry you if I myself will cook soup and wash socks? He said. Once again, he pressed the button on the remote control 
and into the apartment burst another broadcast of a soccer match, and money was in short supply. So Kelly found a part-time job. She got a job on an educational website as a supervisor, checked the work of guys who were preparing for exams on online courses. An old laptop, which the woman bought not so long ago, became a good assistant. Of course, he did not solve all the material problems, but now it was possible not to puzzle over what to pay for the apartment. After a while, Kevin began to leave the house in the evenings. He'd come in the morning. He smelled of booze. To all Kelly's questions, he'd say, he's a man, he's entitled. What do you have a right to? One day, Kelly couldn't take it anymore and she started screaming. Go out at night, drink on my money. Oh, that's how you talk. Kevin got angry, so it's your money? I thought it was mutual. We're like a family, but you're the man. You're kind of the breadwinner. I know we're a family, do you? Kevin, when I married you, I thought we were going to work things out together. And you, you put it all on me. You sit in front of the TV all day, and now you're drinking. Callie yelled, Yeah, it's a mess, but it has to be dealt with. What kind of man are you? You sit on my neck, and you're happy. Oh, you don't like me as a man? Kevin caught on to the word and took a swing. That night he hit Kelly for the first time, slapped her. The woman cried in the kitchen all night. In the morning on his knees, Kevin apologized. He swore that soon everything would change. He would find a job. Kelly wouldn't have to work two jobs and sleep four o'clock a night. Yeah, things would change and Kelly believed him and decided to forget the slap. After all, she provoked it. Shouldn't have charged him when he'd been drinking. After a week, Kevin had really changed. Eyes lit up, drove around, made a couple phone calls. One morning, he showed up at Kelly's, clean shaven and in a suit. Where are you going? Kelly gasped. I got a job, proudly replied Kevin. One of my friends offered me a job with a rich family to accompany the child to school, to pick him up from school. I'll drive him around. Kelly, would you have seen that car? It's a dream, the latest model. Kelly didn't know much about car brands, so it didn't make a big impression on her, but she was so happy. Finally, the black streak in their lives was over. Now Kevin would get a grip on his head and everything would be fine. Also, the kid's mother found out I was a soccer player and asked me to tutor her son. Not for free, of course. Anyway, Kelly, we're gonna make a life, you and me. Kevin said, and then laughing happily, he picked Kelly up and took her for a spin. And she laughed, now they'll be healed. But Kathy, when she called her friend to see how she was doing, didn't share her joy. You should find out who this family is, what the guy does for a living, what his wife looks like. Or look, this employer with your husband. Kathy warned me. Nonsense, you say. Kelly dismissed it. She didn't even think it was possible. After two months, Kelly noticed that Kevin was coming home later and later. One night he didn't come home at all, and the next evening he showed up smelling of women's perfume. Kelly found traces of lipstick on his shirt, and she made a huge scene. Screaming, crying, blaming her husband, and he looked at her with a grin. You chicken! Finally, he said, have you looked at yourself in the mirror long ago? When was the last time you were in the hairdresser? And what are you wearing? Have you ever heard of dresses? Always in the same jeans and stretchy sweatshirts. I don't have time for salons. With resentment, Kelly said, I've been working two jobs and I'm still working two jobs. I don't see your paycheck. Okay, first, you said you had to dress appropriately. Then you had to get a bodyguard's license, also for a fee. 
Meanwhile, I was paying rent, buying groceries. Where's your paycheck? In a safe place. Kevin grinned cheekily, and it's none of your business. What do you mean? That's what I mean. Chicken, I'm leaving you. Kelly's eyes darkened when she heard that. No, it can't be. He's just telling her to spite her, because they love each other. You disgust me. Kevin said angrily, I'm in a relationship, and you should know who I'm in a relationship with. You'll never be like that. Jenna, she's wonderful. Jenna, who's that? The woman who hired me. What about her family? She has a son, a husband. No husband. He died a year ago. But Liam and I got along, and he doesn't mind calling me dad. After Kevin said that, he started packing his things. Kelly sat silently watching. There were no more tears. The man she loved so much, the one she would turn herself inside out for, had betrayed her in such a despicable way. Kevin, as if nothing had happened, was rummaging through his closet. His cell phone rang. Yes, honey. Yeah, I talked to her. He said cheerfully into the receiver and looked at Kelly with a sneer. It's okay, come on over. Kelly felt as if she had been punched in the face by those words. She jumped up and started to push Kevin out of the apartment and he only laughed. Kelly, you're a loser. He said to her already on the doorstep, slinging his bag over his shoulder. You realize life is a game and you'll always be on the losing side. Go away already. Kelly whispered helplessly. I can't see you anymore. And life, life will put everything in its place. Let's see which one of us loses. Kevin laughed and walked out, slamming the door. Kelly slid down the wall and howled like a wounded wolf. She didn't go to work in the morning. She called in sick. She was indeed sick. Her soul ached from the betrayal of her loved one. All day she lay on the couch, curled up, and in the evening, the doorbell rang. Kevin's back. He's changed his mind. She would forgive him. Kelly jumped up from the couch, but Kathy was there. Hello, friend. Kathy said cheerfully, Why do you look so bad? Are you sick? And why is your cell phone unavailable? I've been calling. I've been calling. I was worried about you. Must be dead. Kelly remembered and hurried to turn her phone back on. What if Kevin called? But no, he didn't. Tell me about it. Kathy didn't ask, she demanded. And then Kelly burst into tears. She sobbed. She fell on her friend's shoulder and talked, while Kathy listened and grew more and more gloomy. What a bastard, she said when she found out. I always knew he was a bastard. I didn't like him. But on the other hand, it's a good thing I did. Kelly, imagine if you had a child. How much worse would that be? Kathy, I kind of am. Kelly sobbed. What, are you pregnant or something? Kathy exclaimed. Kelly just nodded. She'd been meaning to tell Kevin, but she'd been putting it off, waiting for the right opportunity, and it hadn't presented itself. Don't tell him. Kathy advised, find a good doctor. He'll do it, and you'll forget the whole story like a bad dream. No doctor, whispered Kelly. Kathy, I can't do this. Why not? Can you imagine being alone with a baby? I do, because my mom raised me alone, too. I can do it. Kathy, I was up all night tonight thinking, you know, this baby is a part of me. It's like taking a piece of my heart. I can't do it. Well, then we gotta get this creep back into the family. We have to tell him about the baby. That's not necessary. Kathy, I thought he was coming back tonight. I mean, we had a fight. He'd make something up out of anger. But he didn't. I'm looking at his face right now before he left. Kathy, he's happy with someone else. He doesn't need me or the baby. We'll see about that. Kathy was angry. 
No, this creep is going to enjoy his life, and you're here with his baby. You can't do that. At least let him pay child support. In vain, Kelly asked Kathy not to tell Kevin about the baby. She found him anyway and told him everything. They met at the coffee shop. What does she want from me? Kevin shrugged. I'm not sure it's my baby at all. Who was she hanging around her store with? Anyway, if she thinks I'm going to pay her child support, she's wrong. She's not getting a dime from me. I'll prove the baby's not mine. But it's your baby. I'll prove it's not mine. Kevin grinned cheekily. At that time, a spectacular blonde girl, a little older than Kevin, and a boy of about 10 years old came to the table. Honey, here we are. The woman smiled. Lunch? Yes, Jenna, of course. Kevin smiled eagerly. He jumped up from his seat, helping the woman sit down, then sat the boy down, tousled his hair affectionately, and he smiled back. What an ideal. Kathy couldn't stand it any longer and stood up. Are you aware, dear Jenna, that your Kevin is about to become a father? Jenna, don't listen. Kelly's making it up. Kevin started to justify himself. Jenna grimaced and looked squeamishly at Kathy. I realize you're a friend of Kelly's, so give her some friendly advice about terminating the pregnancy and staying out of our family. Kevin and I are a family. We've already filed the divorce papers with your Kelly. We, oui. Kathy smirked. Uh-huh. She said nothing more and walked away from the ugly couple and the spoiled boy who sat with his feet up on a neighbor's chair. How to help her friend? Kathy decided not to say anything to her about the meeting at the cafe, so as not to upset Kelly further. At first, Kelly felt as if her soul had been ripped out of her, but gradually she began to come to her senses, and even the divorce went completely calm, and she didn't say anything about the pregnancy. Out of pride, Kevin didn't ask. He wasn't interested in Kelly's problems now. He had a new love, and Kelly lived in a modest rented apartment. She worked at the store, in due time went on maternity leave, and until the birth continued to work with her students on online courses. The labor began suddenly, rapidly, at night. She just got up from her desk, turning off her laptop as her stomach contracted sharply. She reached for the phone with her last strength. Why did you take so long? The paramedic in the ambulance told her off on the way to the hospital. You should have been hospitalized a week ago. I couldn't. Squirming in pain, Kelly said, I have a job. Everybody's got work, sighed the paramedic, and you need to think about you and the baby right now. It's gonna be okay, mommy. Don't worry. My son was born healthy. Dark-haired, like Kelly, Kevin's blonde. If he looks like his mommy, he'll be happy said the nurse as she brought the baby in for his first feeding. You have a good boy. My boy, Kelly said fondly and cried. Why are you crying? You should be happy. Others dream of such happiness for years. I understand, but I'm scared. He and I are the only ones in this world. You have each other, and that's the main thing. While he's little, you'll take care of him and when he grows up, your son will be your protector. That's right, a protector. Kelly smiled through her tears and cuddled her baby boy. She would do anything to make her baby happy. From the hospital, Kelly and Robert were picked up by Kathy and Miranda. They got ready, bought presents, and helped with everything at first. And then Kathy arrived one day confused. Kelly, I need to have a serious talk with you. What's wrong? Kelly's scared. I'm getting married. Why are you saying that like you've been hit with a bag? Dude, congratulations. Yeah, thanks, but I'm leaving. Noah's from out of town. He's got his own chain of body shops. So I've made up my mind. But that's great. Kathy, I hope you'll be happy. 
Yeah, he's a good guy, but I'm worried about you. You're on your own. My auntie went south too, married a southerner, sold her business, and doesn't seem to regret it. That's how fast she did it. She sends her love. Kelly, how are you going to be all alone? Of course, Kelly was a little confused. She's used to Kathy helping her out, looking after Robert, Miranda dropping in occasionally. Now she's on her own, but Miranda and Kathy have their own lives to manage. I can manage. She nodded confidently. Don't worry about me. Be happy. But we'll call you, even visit you when we can. Of course, friend. And they hugged goodbye, even cried. But we have to move on. Until the age of one and a half years, Robert, Kelly somehow managed to make ends meet, and then from the state payments were very meager. And the courses she'd been working part-time at had all but died out. There wasn't enough money for food. It all went to rent. Kelly thought about working, but she couldn't go out to the store yet. Robert had no one to leave him with. The nursery school waiting list was so long that it would be two more years. One day, she saw an ad on a bus stop that a real estate company needed a sticker. Figured, there is obviously no rigid schedule, decided to call. Here's 1,000 flyers, handed to her in the office of the girl administrator. For five days, you need to go around the streets that will be on your list and paste ads. For this, you will receive $20. Keep in mind that your work will be checked. The money was not much, but Kelly agreed. At least Robert would have enough for milk and cottage cheese. So she started working as a poster girl. She would get up early in the morning while Robert was sleeping and run around the neighborhood with glue and flyers. It was good where there were special boards for announcements on the entrances but more often she had to paste them directly on the walls. Often she heard so many nasty things about herself because she was dirtying the walls. Kelly had a plan or she wouldn't get paid. One time they even let the dog loose on her. Good thing the dog was smarter than his owners. A huge Rottweiler ran up to Kelly, who was white with fear, hugged her and moved away. Oh. Get out of here and don't come here again, shouted the man, the owner of the dog, as Kelly then cried on her way home, not out of fear for herself, but out of resentment. Why are people so mean? And then the minute the dog attacked her, it went through her mind. What about Robert? He's alone, he'll wake up soon. And after lunch, Kelly went to work with a baby and there was also enough negativity although in the form of a child, people reacted softer. Sometimes they even helped me put a better sticker on the paper. Yes, people are different. There were also understanding. In the evening, having fed and put her son to bed, Kelly sat by the window and thought when everything would change in her life and whether it would change. Robert was already growing out of his stuff. Good thing Kathy had sent some new suits at least she had something to wear out. By the way, Kelly didn't complain to her friend. She said that everything with Robert was fine, but in reality it was otherwise. One day, her part-time job on the internet completely stalled. The money from the stickers went to food. The doorbell rang. Hello, darling. In the hallway stepped a full lady of about 50 years, the owner of the apartment. I thought I'd drop by and see how you were doing. Kelly was confused when she saw the landlady. She hadn't been here since she and Kevin had rented the apartment. Kelly had been making regular payments on her credit card. Evelyn, this is so unexpected, mumbled the young mother. Yeah, we're fine. We're fine. The neighbors told me that you live alone now. You have a child. Did your fool leave you? I knew he was unreliable. Anyway, that's not what I'm talking about. Kelly, I'm giving you a raise this month. Don't get me wrong. Everything's getting more expensive, and I haven't raised the price in almost three years, and I have expenses. I bought a car, 
and it's eating up so much money. How much? Kelly blurted out. How much what the car costs? Oh, the rent. I'm not being pushy. I know you have a kid, but I'm raising the price by 5000 If you don't like it, you can move out now. I've already got someone who's willing to pay my price. Where am I going to go? Barely holding back tears, Kelly replied, I'll pay. Good. Evelyn smiled. Okay, I'm off. So it's a deal. Kelly nodded. She had no other choice. But where would she get the money? And then, for the first time, she decided to call Kevin. She should tell him that he had a child. He was a father, Robert. He could help in some way. Kevin answered her call. A woman's laughter and a boy's laughter could be heard in the background. It was clear that Kevin was quite content with life. Need at hand, he hummed into the phone. I didn't talk you into having this baby. I thought you'd made up your mind. So you knew about the baby? Kelly was stunned. Yeah, your girlfriend came to me, appealed to my conscience. Why are you surprised? I told her then and I'll tell you again. I'm not sure it's my baby. It's interesting. You kept quiet all this time, and now you've suddenly decided to confess. Why would I do that? I'm just having a really hard time. I have no money. I have to pay the rent. Forgetting her pride, Kelly said with difficulty, You know, it's not my problem. You're on your own. And he hung up. Kelly sat there like a stone. Why did she call? She just ruined her own mood, and Kathy, she didn't say a word the whole time. I guess she just didn't want to upset her. Maybe Kathy should call Kathy, borrow from her, and then pay her back. No, her friend wouldn't say no, and she wouldn't demand it right away. But Kelly wouldn't feel comfortable. And what would she use to pay her back? And then Kelly remembered there was something that would save her and Robert. It's some earrings her mom gave her. Mom gave them to Kelly just before she left. She never wore them herself. Kelly didn't know they existed, and Mom kept them. Said Kelly's father gave them to her. They're very expensive. Maybe you'll need them when you have a daughter. Mom whispered and with a trembling hand pulled the earrings from somewhere in the nightstand and said they were diamonds. Kelly didn't believe it then, and she didn't believe it now. She thought they were just glass, but they were precious to her as a memory of her mom, and she never wore them, and neither did her mom. They lay in her notebook bag from university, in a simple box from under lollipops. What if they really were diamonds? The next day, out for a walk with Robert, in addition to glue and advertisements, Kelly grabbed the earrings. On the way, she stopped by a pawn shop with her son. Where did you get such a miracle? Surprised exclaimed the appraiser, just looking at the jewelry and squinted suspiciously. Looking at the modestly dressed young mother and child, whose clothes were clearly already small. It was a gift from the late mom. Kelly replied calmly, It's easy to check, nodded the appraiser. For a long time he rummaged through his papers, then looked at the earrings. Finally, he named a price and asked for a passport, almost 100000 To Kelly, that was a lot of money. She immediately agreed to pawn them. Young lady, do you have any idea of their real value? Asked the appraiser while the documents were being drawn up. I don't know. Kelly admitted, All my life I thought they were plain, glass ones. Glass? The man laughed. Come on, I can see you really need the money. Yes, I'll throw in another 30000 but no foreclosure. Do you agree? In principle, Kelly agreed to the first option, and she liked the second offer even more. It was just a little embarrassing. She was selling her mom's memory, but she had no other choice, and her mom would understand, and she'd never buy back those earrings. The money from the earring sale was a big help. 
Callie immediately bought her son some new clothes, paid off a small utility debt, and put aside a few payments for Evelyn. The young woman realized that she couldn't be lavish, or it would be even harder, and soon she got a call from the education department. There was a vacancy in the nursery, and it was a pity to give the baby to the kindergarten, and he is not even two years old. But what to do? We have to live somehow. So Robert went to the nursery, and Kelly went to work. Only very soon the store management started to grumble. The young mom took two sick days every month. Who's going to work? Soon they said they didn't want any problem employees. Well, I'm trying. Kelly justified herself. It's just that my son has recently gone to kindergarten. Children are all small, often get sick when in a new team get, until he is not used to it yet. How long do we have to wait for your son to get used to it? No, no one will pay for your sick days. Quit. That's the answer. It was no use arguing with the bosses. Kelly stayed at home for a couple months, scraping by on the internet and mostly pulled a little bit from the untouchable reserve that was left from the earrings, we had to live on something. She didn't work as a poster girl anymore. When she went to the store, she gave it up. Now there were other workers there. They didn't need her. But one day, she got a call from the real estate office. Kelly, good afternoon. She heard the familiar voice of the receptionist, Adriana. We'd like to invite you to an interview for a vacancy. What position? Boss looked at your resume and was very surprised that a person with a higher education is quite literate, worked for us as a poster boy. There's another offer for you. Would you like to try to work as a realtor? Yeah, I don't know. I never imagined myself in this role. It is not to sell buns and apartments, but the principle is the same. Adriana laughed. You have to praise your product, that's all. Well, will you come over? You know I have a small child. It will not interfere with your work. You can always arrange a time that's convenient for both parties. I convinced Adriana. The director of the real estate firm was Sebastian, an elderly man with serious health problems. He'd had a heart condition for years and even surgery hadn't changed anything. All because he didn't have much desire to live. After his family, his wife, daughter, son-in-law, and grandson died in a plane crash five years ago. The only thing that kept him in this life was his work, the work of many years. He couldn't give it all up like that. That's why he was pulling it all on his shoulders. In principle, his office was not too famous in the city and could not compete with the big competitors, but it had its price too. Not so long ago, his realtor left for another firm more successful. Sebastian was looking for a new candidate and decided to look at the resumes of those who were hired on a fixed-term contract. Interesting. He was surprised when he read the resume of Kelly, a young woman with a higher education. Why doesn't she get a job in her specialty? Yes, it's complicated. Adriana shrugged her shoulders, and she has a small child. Call her for sure. Sebastian, I repeat, she has a small child. So, call her. So Adriana called. Kelly arrived for the interview at three o'clock. Sebastian saw a very young woman, almost a girl, only very tired from everyday worries. He started the conversation from afar, asked about his son, about his studies, just about life. At the end of the conversation, he already roughly realized who was sitting in front of him. A simple little knave girl who got into a difficult life, but does not give up. Sebastian decided to give her a chance. He liked her, reminded him of his late daughter. Soon Kelly got a new job. Now she's a realtor. Of course, there were a lot of difficulties, had to learn a lot. At the same time, Robert was constantly sick, but the new team was sympathetic to this. And then Kelly was lucky. 
she was able to sell one apartment and the second one very favorably. Buyers liked to communicate with a nice pretty girl, while Kelly was not intrusive in her work, but at the same time was able to persuade, although about the shortcomings of apartments did not hide. This honesty was what brought her to the table. Sebastian, too, was glad he had hired this girl. Kelly did her best. Little by little, things got better between her and Robert. Now the young mother did not count the change, whether her son tomorrow will have enough for milk or not. They weren't lavish, but they weren't poor either, and then disaster struck. Sebastian collapsed in his office one morning and died immediately. His heart was failing. Kelly was very worried. She had become attached to her boss in a kindred way, and also worried about the question of what will happen to their office. The distant relative who inherited the firm was not at all interested in its development. It was a man far from business. He considered selling the firm a very troublesome business and postponed it for later. He decided to just appoint a business manager and himself to continue to live quietly, receiving dividends. He is not a young man, and why should he have these worries, business, competitors, inspections, and so on? What was Kelly's surprise when she was asked to be the manager? But I haven't worked here for a year yet. There are more experienced employees, she told Christopher, to which he showed her a letter written in Sebastian's hand. In it he, addressing Christopher, wrote that it would be right if the firm is not sold. And Sebastian would like to give a chance to the young but very capable girl, Kelly. She could, she would pull his ca- It had been a few hours of waiting. Kelly had already started to doze off sitting in the car when she saw the man she needed. Michael was a very well-known man in town, in his late forties, looking quite decent a tall, sturdy, brown-haired man. Kelly knew he was single, but that information interested her the least. She was concerned that this man was difficult to negotiate with, but she had to at least try. Michael. She called out to the man, stepping decisively out of the car. Excuse me, would you mind giving me a few minutes? The man stopped and looked in surprise at the fragile brunette in a business suit. A confident look, a ringing voice, an eye straight black, almost gypsy. Yes, Kelly had interested him at first, only in appearance. No, he wasn't a ladies' man, but he noticed beautiful women. And afterwards, when they began to communicate on business, sitting in his office, Michael appreciated how smart this Kelly was and unknown whether by her charm or her ability to persuade, but Kelly achieved that Michael's company signed a cooperation agreement with their firm. But it didn't stop there. One afternoon, Kelly's phone rang. It was Michael, and he asked Kelly out on a date. She gave it some thought and said yes. Why wouldn't she? She really liked Michael. They sat in the restaurant, talked. Michael told her about himself, that he was born in this city, grew up, studied, and even got married, but he and his wife separated after a year that didn't have time to have a child. He's been working alone ever since, and you too, I understand, a businesswoman. Michael asked with a smile, no personal life. Kelly was just about to answer. The nanny called and excitedly informed her that Robert had a fever and the medication wasn't working. I'll be right there. Kelly answered and looked at Michael. You'll have to excuse me, my son is sick. I have to go right away. Why don't I give you a ride? Michael responded immediately. He was a little surprised that such a young woman already had a son, so she had a husband. He wasn't happy about that. But his mood improved when Kelly told him that she had been raising her son alone since birth. Now you're talking, businesswoman, she grinned. I've worked as everything, haven't I? And cashier and salesman even was a sticker to feed my son. But actually, I'm a teacher by profession. I see. Michael nodded. 
you know, life is like that. You go through a lot of things before you find your own. I wasn't originally a builder either. You won't believe it. I'm a telecommunicator by my first profession. When my wife left me, accusing me of not earning enough and all that, I was so hurt. I began to think and decide what to change in my life in the first place to prove to my wife. I built a small business with a friend, and we got with him in the 90s. We were able to rise. Now I have what I have. I don't know about my wife. She went somewhere in Siberia to her parents. I think she got married and lives in some village. To be honest, I haven't cared for a long time. So they learned a little more about each other along the way. At Kelly's house, they said goodbye and arranged to meet again. Robert turned out to be fine. The doctor from the ambulance suggested a trip to the clinic in the morning just to be on the safe side. That's all. You must have eaten a lot of ice cream? The doctor squinted slyly at the boy. Yes, there was a bucket in the freezer. I ate almost all of it. Robert lowered his head. Son, how could you do that? I told you not to eat too much. Kelly exclaimed and looked angrily at the nanny. Emily slammed her eyes shut in fright. I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Kelly just waved her hand. What can I do now? It would teach her not to buy buckets of ice cream. Michael called the next day and asked how Robert was feeling. Yes, he was fine. Kelly smiled into the phone. His throat is a little red, but he doesn't have a fever. But he had the ice cream of a lifetime. It happens. Michael laughed. I'm calling to invite you and your son to the park for the weekend. Robert will be well by the weekend, won't he? I think so. Kelly was a little embarrassed by Michael's suggestion, but at the same time she wanted to keep in touch with him and not just for work. So of course she said yes. And that weekend the three of them were at the recreation park, riding the carousel, Robert jumping on the trampoline, riding his scooter, it was a warm summer evening. They sat at a table in a street cafe and ate barbecue with pleasure. Real men like meat. Michael winked at Robert. What's with the ice cream, right, Robert? Uh-huh. The boy replied contentedly. It's good. Why only men? Girls can eat meat, too. Kelly joked. No arguments, maybe another portion and Michael moved his plate. Kelly, smiling, took a bite, though she had more. Michael smiled, too. How much did he like this sweet girl? Yes, she was younger than him by a whole ten years, even a little more, but he was easy and simple with her, straight native. And Kelly felt, for the first time in years, that she had a man by her side. And late that night, as Michael carried the sleeping Robert home to Kelly's house, the boy suddenly woke up and wrapped his arms around the man's neck. Feverishly, he whispered in her ear, Uncle Michael, be my daddy. Kelly was close by and heard everything. She blushed as red as a cancer. Michael smiled embarrassedly. Go to sleep, son. Suddenly, he whispered and gently laid the boy on the couch and then they sat in the living room for a long time, not knowing what to say to each other. Each had his own past offenses and disappointments, and each was afraid to be burned again. But they were drawn to each other. No more than that. They felt each other, every fiber of their being. Kelly, Michael finally spoke. I know you've been hurt in the past, and you're afraid of something like this happening again, but I can't help myself. I close my eyes and I see you. I hear your voice. I want to be with you to love you. I want Robert to call me daddy. I want to go fishing with him, to the woods, to play soccer with him. Not soccer. Kelly smiled sadly, and then she smiled cheerfully. Let it be tennis or volleyball, or at least checkers. Whatever you say. And Michael hugged her and stayed in their house until morning 
And in the morning, when Kelly woke up, she didn't find Michael around and was very upset. Oh, stupid, she berated herself. She knew she couldn't trust men. And still she had stepped on the same rake again. He left, got what he wanted and left. She was so hurt that she cried. And then Robert and Michael came into the room. And here we were making breakfast with Robert, said Michael. Why are you crying? No, I'm just crying. Kelly quickly wiped away her tears and smiled. What about my housekeeper? I gave her the day off. You don't mind a little housekeeping, do you? I just want it to be just the three of us tonight. Come on, we're making pancakes. Right, Robert? Yes, Dad. Robert replied happily and jumped into bed with Kelly. Mommy, I'm so happy today. And the boy clung to his mother, and Kelly stroked his head in confusion. Yes, she had always realized that her son lacked a father's love, but she had not expected that Michael, Robert would accept so immediately. Maybe the boy had just reached out out of naivete. No, he's a very cautious child. He just felt Michael as his soulmate. And just like that, Michael came into their lives. A month later, Kelly and Michael were married. It was a big wedding. Famous people of the city had fun at the wedding. The local newspapers covered it. Kathy and Miranda were at the wedding, both with their husbands, and Miranda had a belly. Just a week after the wedding, Kelly got a call from an unknown number. Good afternoon. My name is Charles. The man introduced himself. Kelly, I read about you in the papers. Who are you? Kelly was surprised. The thing is, I recently found something that I gave to my favorite girl, Camille, a long time ago. You know Camille? That's my mom. She's no longer with us. How sad. I don't understand. What are you talking about? The diamond earrings. Kelly, let's meet you. I need to talk to you. Kelly agreed, but she went to the meeting with Michael. What this man wanted, she didn't fully understand. But when they met at the cafe, it suddenly became clear. Kelly was facing her father. The resemblance was uncanny. Yes, Charles was already over 50. His hair touched with gray, but his features, his eyes. Yes, Kelly looked just like her father, and he looked at Kelly without taking his eyes off of her. God, I can't believe it, Charles whispered. Daughter, I don't know. Kelly was confused, too. They sat down at the table. After an awkward silence, Charles pulled out earrings. They were the same earrings that Kelly had sold at a pawn shop a few years ago. Thanks to them, she and her son had survived for a while. Kelly, I see you recognize these earrings. I'm not going to ask why you sold them. I know it wasn't for the good. Just listen to my story, Charles said. He said that almost 30 years ago, he met a girl named Camille. They fell in love, but Charles' mom got involved. She was outraged that her son, a student of a prestigious university, got involved with a simple girl from the backwoods. Yes, Camille was not a stupid girl either. She studied at a pedagogical institute, but she had neither parents nor money. Why would Charles want such a bride? But Charles didn't listen to her. They even applied to the marriage building. And that's when Charles gave Camille a pair of earrings. This piece of jewelry had a story of its own. The fact is that the first husband of Charles's mother died when the son was not even a year old. Soon his mother married another man. Charles was though the first, but unloved son. He often lived with his grandmother, mother and father for months at a time. So when he turned 18, his grandmother gave him earrings, the family jewel. It was actually customary in our family to give them to daughters-in-law, but I never liked your mom, honestly. Grandma confessed. So I procrastinated, and then my son died. 
So I've had the earrings all these years. I was waiting for you to get married, and then I'll give them to your wife. But I feel that I don't have long left, so I'm giving them to you now. You can give them to your sweetheart when you meet her. Soon Grandma was gone, and Charles kept the jewelry with him, never telling his mother. Then he met Camille and gave her the earrings. A month before the wedding, Charles had to go to a student conference in another city. When he returned, Camille was nowhere to be found. He looked for her, made inquiries, but nothing. It was later that he found out his mother had arranged it. Camille said he was marrying someone else, said some nasty things to her, and when Charles was looking for her, going to the police, the stepfather got involved. They didn't tell him where his Camille was. After the institute, Charles went on the party line, then got a job in the city administration. He married someone else. Charles didn't love her so much anymore, but she wasn't a bad girl either. Then his mother started to interfere again. That's when Charles had a fight with his mother once and for all. Only then she said that it was to her credit that Camille disappeared from his life. Charles decided that there was no point in looking for his beloved after so many years. He had a wife for a long time. Children never happened, but he and his wife lived normally and fought and reconciled. Everything happened. He just stopped communicating with his mother, although he still came sometimes to her house. The driver brought money and groceries. He couldn't abandon his mother. Especially since his brother and sister live far away, and recently he decided to make a gift to his wife Cindy, ordered a piece of jewelry, and there at the jeweler he saw those earrings. Their family value. The jeweler at first did not want to admit where he got this jewelry. Then he told him that he bought the earrings from a pawn shop in the city. Just in case, he even took the information about who deposited them in the pawn shop. That's how Charles found out about Kelly. Now he had no trouble finding out everything about the girl. It turned out that Kelly was the daughter of Camille. Charles learned, of course, that Camille had left the world, and then he saw the front page of the newspaper, and there was a picture that said that the previously unknown Kelly had married one of the richest businessmen in town. Charles immediately realized that his daughter was in the picture, and he saw her features. Yes, I immediately recognized the earrings that my mother gave me," admitted Kelly, having listened to the story. But it's still so unexpected, because my mother never told me anything about you. Camille was very proud. Charles sighed. I blame her, and I blame you, Kelly. I know you've had a hard time in your life. It has been. Kelly nodded. But everything's great now. But I still can't believe you're my father. We should do a DNA test, and then there will be no doubt. Michael suggested. Kelly and Charles agreed with him. And ten days later, the results came back. Yes, Kelly and Charles were related to each other. Charles introduced his daughter to his wife Cindy. The woman. Who had never had children of her own, quickly found common ground with Kelly, befriended Robert. She took a liking to Michael. They became friends, and only one thought kept Kelly in suspense. The story Charles had told her about her mother reminded her very much of another story she had heard years ago on the driveway, the time when she had cried and didn't know where to go. One day, Kelly ventured to ask her father. What is my grandmother's name? You never said her name. Was it Vanessa by any chance? Charles stared at his daughter in surprise. How would she know? And Kelly told him the story of meeting an old woman and her bald cat. She still has that cat. My driver always freaks out when he sees it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Turns out we could have met a lot sooner. That's unbelievable. No, I can't believe it. I've been giving her money for all these years to do things and housekeepers, and she's been fooling young girls, but she's not doing it now. I hired her a housekeeper myself, 
Maybe it's another woman with a cat. Just a coincidence. Callie guessed. Well, let's not guess. Let's go. It's time for me to meet my mother. And it wasn't a coincidence. Same house, same entryway, apartment number 12. The door was opened by the same Vanessa. A little older, a little sadder, but she still had the same keen eyes. The same Tom in her arms, only older too. Charles, the woman gasped. Have you decided to visit your decrepit mother? You're not that old, Mom, Charles replied. But I've decided that it's time for us to put an end to this feud. Did you realize you were wrong? Vanessa threw her head back in victory. The cat in her arms meowed something sharp. I don't want to find out more about who was right and who was wrong. I just want you to meet your granddaughter. This is Kelly. The woman squinted her eyes. Callie looked at her grandmother with a smile. She had long ago forgiven her for all the wrongs she had done to her. Her own grandmother stood before her. I've seen you somewhere, Vanessa said puzzled. Of course you have, Callie nodded. I bought the wrong vitamins for your Tom once. Vanessa froze at those words and then clutched at her heart. Yes, she remembered her lodger who had run away from her so quickly. She was a stubborn girl like her father. Nothing happened to Vanessa. She was more playing, though she was sincerely surprised that her son had a grown-up daughter. And most importantly, she already knew her. When Vanessa heard that Camille, the same Camille, was long gone, she thought for a while. She was silent for a long time, and then she said, I'm sorry, son. Perhaps I was wrong, and you, my granddaughter, forgive me. Charles hugged his mother. He had forgiven her long ago. They were family, and Kelly decided not to remember all the wrongs. We have to move on. Why touch old wounds? She introduced Vanessa to her family, and the old lady melted when she saw little Robert. Charles is small. She gave her verdict and kissed her great-grandson on the top of his head. Robert was delighted. He now had a daddy, a mommy, a grandmother and grandfather, a great-grandmother and a bald cat. The boy immediately demanded that his mom buy him one. Oh no, son. Callie laughed. Let me and daddy get you a simple kitten. Why don't you like my Tom? Vanessa even took offense. I like him, but he's very unusual. Kelly confessed, and everyone laughed. Another year passed. Kelly and Michael were expecting a new addition to the family. Soon they would have another son. One day they were walking together in the park. Michael and Robert ran a little ahead on the path when suddenly someone called Kelly. She looked back, and it was Kevin sitting on a bench. Kelly hardly recognized him. Sloppily dressed, stubbled, clearly hung over. Hi, muffled, Kevin said and got up from the bench. I thought I was mistaken. I thought so too. Kelly replied, how are you? I'm fine, and you? Oh, it's all gone to shit. Jenna kicked me out, left me without a dime, and now I'm living in an abandoned house on the edge of town. Robert came running up to Kelly. Is that my son? Kevin's eyes lit up. No, that's my son, replied for Kelly Michael, who also came up behind the child and realized who was talking to his wife. Yes, I'm sorry, mumbled Kevin. I must have made a mistake. Kelly and Michael walked away, Robert leading the way down the path, Michael holding her hand gently. There was another life beating beneath her heart, and Kelly didn't want to look back. Yes, life, the game. Sometimes it feels like you've been defeated, destroyed, abandoned, but it only feels like that. It's only the first round. There's the rest of your life ahead of you, and it may happen that if you lose once, you win much more later.